um, we will do a little jump in our first session uh, because we left saying that uh, we will meet Beatrice Colomina, who is an architectural historian, uh, theorist, and curator. Uh, and she will start session two. So I leave to the floor to her. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to Caroline and to Agnieszka and to all the sponsors for organizing this great uh, exhibition. Yes, I'm from architecture, so what is uh, uh, architecture to do with, uh, with the nuclear? Well, a lot. You will see that uh, where architecture is actually inseparable from the nuclear um, in different senses. So, for example, this is the cover of Arts and Architecture magazine in 1946, uh, an atomic head by Herbert Matter. Uh, at the time uh, working for the IMS office, and this is the IMS house. Uh, the magazine uh, Arts and Architecture was sponsoring the uh, case study houses in California. So what is uh, interesting here is on the cover, you have the atomic uh, uh, bomb, but the houses, the case study houses that the magazine was a sponsor represent uh, idealized uh, images of post-war domesticity in the setting precisely of modern architecture, right? But the atomic head of, uh, of Herbert Matter, of course, conveys existential anxiety, uh, the existential anxiety of the mom moment that is precisely hidden by modern architecture. So the nuclear um, house uh, consists precisely on a happy, colorful, beautiful uh, modern house on the lawn and a bomb shelter uh, underneath. Even the re rehearsal of going into the shelter is presented as a kind of game. You know, this is war games, is the caption of this picture in the, uh, in the popular press. So post-war America, you can say, is split in two. The lawn represents this divided psyche. On the surface, modern architecture, consumerism, more smiles. Underneath, uh, anxiety and the threat of nuclear annihilation. And you have all these things that are supposed to be in the bomb shelter, and you don't see here, but one of the recommendations of the US government is tranquilizers, right? So you have to have at least 100 pills, they say, for a family of four. But my question <laughs> is, why is modern architecture the face of the nuclear? Why is it representing the, the unrepresentable nuclear uh, destruction? And why even more interesting when the nuclear, um, sorry, I went too fast, the nuclear um, uh, energy for peace, the campaign, again, modern architecture turns out to be what represents this new uh, thing. And it's offering precisely new images of domesticity in a kind of propaganda effort that is best communicated in popular affairs, such as the House of the Future uh, in the Daily Mail um, exhibition in London of 1956, where Alison and Peter Smithson presented their house of the future, and here is the context, 1956, a bunch of very traditional houses, and the house of the future is what you see in the, uh, in the end. So an all enclosed box, uh, you know, and inside there is another box, so a box inside a box. The windows that you see here are only so that you can see the house in the exhibit, but in fact, as you can see, it's a box inside a box, and the visitors circle around the box, and through these holes, peek, peek into this, uh, into this interior, then they go up and look down into this house. But the house, as you can see in the plan, is completely hermetically close to the outside. It's a kind of bomb shelter. There is no outside. It's like a submarine or a spaceship. And, and in that sense, the walls of the craft are only uh, pierced at a very particular moment of the entrance. You saw in the plan up there. And here is the entrance, which is only very few people are allowed to come in and is completely enclosed to the outside by an electrically operated steel door that comes down between these very thick uh, uh, sets of walls. Uh, it's also interesting that the few that come in are, are supposed to pass through a decontamination procedure, right? This is what the House of the Future is presented as, right? So the the, this defense against the outside continues inside against all forms of, uh, of contamination. The bathtub, for example, cleans itself with detergent. They talk about the continuous uh, rounded surfaces that the architects say you can clean the whole house with a damp cloth. Uh, towels are considered also a health hazard, so the shower also has nozzles with uh, hot air, so you don't need to dry yourself. And this, the bed has an only 
uh, one seat because with the control temperature you don't need uh, bed clothing and all the problems of uh, dust mites and all the problems of things. The house, very interestingly, is powered by nuclear energy. The architects insist that the electrical power comes from the nearest atomic power station. Food is also stored for long stays, and the rainwater is collected from the roof, allowing inhabitants, they say, to eventually cut themselves off completely. All the food is bombarded, they say bombarded, with gamma rays, and they clarify an atomic byproduct to kill bacteria, right? So all of this uh, in this house of the future, and then the question I have for you is what about this garden? What about this uh, garden around which the whole house is organized? Well, there are two keys for this grand garden. One, they say that the whole inspiration for the house was this uh, 15th century uh, German panel painting, the Garden of Paradise of 1410, which as you can see is a fortified uh, 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 garden. They claimed that the whole scene had been reproduced, that they have requested from the Daily Mail that the garden included a tree, some spring flowers, water, even a musical instrument that was appropriate to the future. So the garden, you can say, is a safe uh, uh, space, an imaginary world after or before fear. Indeed, the precise purpose seems to be to use the latest technology precisely to reconstruct the garden that precedes all technology, all fear, the Garden of Eden. But also another interesting clue is this diagram, which is the diagram of the, the conceptual diagram of the house, which speaks about this vertical view of unbreathed private air, right? So the fortification is all about producing this tube, this tube of, uh, of, uh, of uh, air, the unbreathed air, which in many ways uncannily somehow uh, anticipates the current obsessions we have uh, with unbreathed air in aeroplanes, in restaurants, and in public buildings. And breathe air, in a way, is the ultimate measure of uh, privacy in an ever more congested and contaminated world. If the garden is all about innocence and purity, the primary role of the house is to filter the outside world and to produce a quasi teleological encounter with this empty sky, a sky that is actually made private uh, by the house. The house in the atomic age becomes a kind of vertical uh, bunker built into a solid defense of identical, because, uh, because you can see there there's a diagram, and even more clearly here, that the house is supposed to be next to others, but there's actually no connection with the neighbors. So the atomic life means withdraw withdrawal into the ultra-private. Now let's jump to 1958 and the uh, Brussels Expo. So if the house of the future of the Smithsons of 1956 was the outlier in that exhibition and was powered by nuclear energy, the theme of the entire Expo in Brussels was the peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy and architecture continued to play a very significant role, uh, starting with the main pavilion, which is called the Atomion, and included two nuclear reactors, uh, BR3 and BR2, which became operative in 1961. Here is the engineer with the model. <laughs> the atomion was meant to give uh, form to something that escapes visibility, radiation, but what I'm arguing here is that again what really gives visibility uh, to the nuclear power in this exhibition was domestic architecture. Here you have the electric uh, and hydraulic pavilion which presented the electric uh, house, which is again a new domesticity powered by nuclear energy. So again, modern architecture is used to give uh, visibility to the invisible. Uh, the atomic uh, theme of the Expo in Brussels, of course, was not an accident. Congo was then uh, a colony of uh, Belgium. You have here the resources of Congo presented in the exhibition. It was supplying the uranium for nuclear fusion in the US, which was very dependent on uh, Belgium and on uh, Congo. In return, Belgium got uh, apparently the first uh, US nuclear reactor. The Dream Kitchen, therefore, is simultaneously a nuclear uh, product and a new of way of living in the atomic, in the space that is of American imperialism and colonial uh, extraction. And there are many more things that one could say about this uh, exhibition, because we don't, but we don't have much time. But uh, the way in which uh, the people from Congo were represented, for example, there was a whole human zoo in which people from the Congo were uh, living in huts and visitors could, visit, uh, could, could see how they were living. 
Anyway, so very problematic. This is uh, 1964. Uh, the, my last example is the New York warfare. Two years after the Cuban missile uh, crisis was the whole country com completely uh, uh, obsessed with this problem. The symbol is the Unisphere, uh, which is dedicated to peace through understanding. And of course, peace here means avoiding a nuclear uh, bomb. In the nuclear war. I'm, I'm trying to concentrate on this pavilion you see there, which is the General Electric Pavilion, which started, which included a series of, uh, this is the, the General Electric Pavilion, which included a series of theatrical sets done by Disney, exhibiting the history of in the interior from 1880 to 1964 by tracing the transformation of the house through electricity. But the uh, underside of this Dome, it was a huge, uh, the biggest projection surface in the world, and it saw the longer history of humankind, the domestication of energy, culminating in a nuclear fusion presented like a new uh, sun. A very dramatic, flashes of thunder and light, and the whole space is lit up in a kind of religious experience. And amazingly enough, then the visitor goes down um, he, uh, uh, one floor to see a demonstration of thermonuclear fusion uh, reaction, they say similar to the H uh, uh, bomb that is taking place every six minutes uh, at the fair, right? So here you have fusion uh, data and successful experiments, six unsuccessful experiments, 78. <laughs> so the point here is that nuclear uh, power, which is of course a byproduct of military technology, was presented both as a mass spectacle but also, as you will see very soon, as a transformation of the interior, a new kind of home uh, for the future. There was also this, uh, uh, the US Office of uh, Civil Defense uh, uh, and the US Atomic uh, Energy Commission presented uh, the whole fallout shelter program, explaining to people how to build their own um, shelter. Don't you love the Americans? <laughs> In Europe, all the, fall, the f nuclear shelters were done uh, communally for, for, for villages for cities, etc. In America, they give you a, a booklet and you are on your own. You can build your own <laughs> shelter. But they also presented this, uh, this is called Atomsville USA, and it's uh, uh, an exhibit at, this, at the fair, which uh, included a demonstration of nuclear energy uh, for children. But the point here, what I was trying to get at, is the uh, underground house which uh, General Electric also is sp sponsor, and it's a traditional suburban ranch-style house that was um, powered by nuclear energy, and it was underground. And the project is the project of this fellow, Jay Swayze. Jay Swayze here breaking uh, ground, was a military instructor and an expert in chemical warfare, and he was commissioned by Plain View in Texas to do a demonstration fallout shelter so people knew what to build in their own houses. And he arrived at the conclusion that it was much more logical to go and all live underground. So it seemed more logical, he said, to make the home and its surroundings a safe harbor because we can not live in constant fear of war, storms, or uncomfortable temperatures. So, I mean, the thing that strikes me here is the equation of war with the water, which is totally with the weather, which is totally symptomatic, right? So here is the underground pavilion at the fair, and you go down, you see, into this uh, underground uh, house. Uh, how could you have, how would you like to have sunshine every day? So the, wind, the, the uh, control of the weather is so extreme that not only you have constant temperature, but you can also control whether you have uh, uh, sunshine or you have uh, rain, depending on your mood, etc. He, since uh, the house is very tacky, here are some of the pictures. Since windows to the outside world seem impossible, he did a, 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 a survey to find out how much value people place on windows, and he concluded that maybe windows are psychologically necessary, but uh, in traditional windows, you actually have to take what you have for a view, and that an artist could do a lot better. So. In the house of the future, <laughs> traditional windows are, are superimposed on dial view murals. And again, every room in the house uh, looks into a panoramic uh, landscape that can be changed at will. And also the time of the day can also be dialed uh, according to the mood or the occasion. 
Here is the plan. As you can see, even if we are all underground, the distinctions between inside and outside uh, persist. Eh? They are made strange. This is the outside uh, patio. This is actually a woman in, in many of the of, uh, uh, Americans built an underground ho house. Jay Swazi was very successful. There are thousands and thousands of these houses in Texas, in Colorado, everywhere. This is a woman in, uh, appear in Life magazine checking the nuclear blast updates uh, up above. Uh, uh, this is the underground house at the fair uh, when it was destroyed and, and covered up, so you can do an archaeological excavation. Uh, and he published this book that was also very successful, Underground Gardens and Home, which included some of the houses that he, he built all over uh, 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 America. Of course, this woman is painting the, the, the garden. But the point, <laughs> since we don't have time, the point that I wanted to finish with this diagram that he published also in the book, where you see the disaster is above and the good life below. So if, whether it's the atomic bomb or a tornado is the same uh, to him, and the good life is underneath. This is the so-called um, atomitat diagram of Swayze, which is exactly the reversal of what I started at the beginning of the good life in America in the 1950s with the uh, underground uh, shelter and the good life above. Now we have entirely reversed it by 1964. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then welcome to the stage to Mark Wigley, architectural historian, uh, theorist, and curator. Thank you. Hey, nice to be here. Um, super nice to be here. It's a kind of nuclear experiment no, to have so many people from so many different fields compacted into one day, uh, <laughs> as if some, there would be some kind of explosion, which would be uh, great. Uh, like Beatrice, I'm representing the Architects Union, and the question is, like, why, why architecture? If you take the most, and then the question would be, well, what is architecture? M maybe architecture is, for example, a structure by which we can live together, where we would mean human, first of all, so maybe buildings, cities, and so on. But we live together could also be to live with technology, to live with more than human, to live with uh, the past, to live with the future. In other words, a, a, an extraordinary, to live with bacteria may be the most important. How, how to live in this more complicated sense, again, you may wonder, like, well, where is architecture in this? Even if you take the simplest understanding of architecture, let's say a kind of like uh, enclosure or a building, you would have to think of the architecture that belongs to the tubes, the cylinders, the rooms, the buildings, the complexes, the cities, the infrastructural circuitry of the nuclear world. Like at the most simple definition, it's a huge in, uh, uh, set of spaces. Uh, you would have to also think of this cycle that goes all the way from extraction through refining, through reactors, through cooling, venting, reprocessing, distribution, and then finally returning some of the nuclear so-called waste uh, to the earth. And you would think all the way along about the architecture that's necessary for this to take place. Not the architecture that's added to it or represents it, but the architecture that makes it possible. So again, architecture as the possibility of living together. If we want to bring this together with the nuclear, we have to bring together the architecture that makes nuclear possible with the architecture that makes, let's say, life uh, possible. In almost all of those uh, cases that we talk about so far, architecture is primarily uh, prophylactic, is, is primarily containment at, at every possible scale. Containment and separation, di dis distancing. And again, you say, well, what could architecture really do with that? Actually, to, to containment uh, and hiding, the architects, we are experts at that. Uh, architects have only one expertise, which is to hide complexity and to produce a kind of plausible image of simplicity that allows complexity to uh, uh, continue, frightening complexity. So containment, it's a little bit our thing. Hiding things, a little bit our things. The invisible is our natural material. We work always architecture. If you want to, by the way, if you want something and you know what you want, you don't ask an architect. Right? They're actually not very good at offering answers to questions. You ask an architect into the conversation, including this conversation today, when you don't know what the question is. And the architect kind of imagines a possible uh, uh, question. So maybe one way to consider this is to consider the possibility that there is a kind of architecture that makes possible not only nuclear energy, but all of the kind of psychopathologies uh, that surround it. And like Beatrice, I would like to focus on 
let's say between 1945 and uh, Japan and 1979, Three Mile Island accident. So a kind of period going from a kind of uh, pessimism and dystopia to a kind of euphoria, optimism, back to a kind of pessimism, but in reality an inc incredible cycle between dystopia and utopia. And again, I would, would like to ask you to think about the possibility that the period from 45 to 79 is sort of like a lens through which you can consider what's happening with the nuclear and with architecture, just a kind of lens. And we're going to go so fast that it's not going to be plausible. But we'll start with a landscape architect on the left. And by the way, maybe the question of the nuclear is a landscape question more than it is, let's say, an architecture question. This is Alfred Caldwell, who was a, both a student and, and a colleague of Ludwig Hilversheimer and Mies van der Rohe, who were teaching in, at IIT Institute of Technology in Chicago. One month after the bombs in Japan, uh, Caldwell calls Hilversheimer and says, what do you think, his, his mentor? And Hilversheimer said, it's all over. Everything is uh, finished. Caldwell immediately wrote an article which was published in December 1945, in which he said, basically, it's astonishing that we are, as a species, able to control the potent primary energy of the universe, but we cannot provide a safe house, and makes this very, I think, important uh, observation that from that moment of 1945, destruction has become the new house, has become the new domesticity. So the question from that point on is how do you live inside uh, uh, destruction? Hilversheimer immediately responds, and Hilversheimer is, of course, at the, at the center of thinking about a kind of dispersal of architecture as the only possible uh, uh, defense. He's writing in 1949 that the, in the world of the atomic bomb, city concentrations can only be a preparation for human suicide. And the, on the right is his proposal of how to deal with the atomic bomb. And notice that the, the, the appropriate response, the architectural response to an atomic bomb is to explode architecture. So we actually have to manufacture another explosion of architecture and distribute it across continental USA and the world. And the idea being that everybody within the circles will be killed. So in other words, what he's doing is to defend against this, uh, you just multiply the number of circles and therefore minimize the number of uh, casualties. With the H-bomb, he had to recalculate, and in response to this article in, in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, 1959, he redrew the map on your right in which all of the urban concentrations should now be 20 miles apart because this means that any, any one bomb would only kill 30,000 people and would severely ruin the lives of whoever happened to be in the wind path uh, of that. So it's a kind of, let's say, ar architecture of destruction. Again, I would say this is an image of of destruction as a, as a new kind of uh, house. It's not a matter of making a house to survive that, it's actually about a matter of making houses in which you die. Second, second example, uh, Buckminster Fuller, always photographed with a dome in the background, his own head famously being understood as a kind of a dome. The dome in the background, 67 World Fair, is meant to be, as it were, coming out of his head. He observed that the, that the atom bomb, and this is of course the document that was, was uh, spies gave to the Russians in order to produce their own bomb, this is the sketch of the American concept of a sphere within a sphere within a sphere. So Fuller notes that spheres make possible the atomic bomb, that the bomb itself is exactly that. Uh, this is the first one, right? That the effect of the bomb is a sphere, and that the only thing that survived the first tactical use of a bomb was a sphere. So he notices that on the roof of this building. So he basically argues that the best thing to make to deal with the atomic bomb, for example, in 1959, is to make a sphere that would cover Manhattan so in other words, the very, the very uh, and which you can see looks like a nuclear explosion. This is meant to be the defense against a nuclear explosion. This is one mile high, just to give you a sense of the size of this. If it's one mile high, then it's almost infinitely thin. Fuller's philosophy is to do more and more with less and less until eventually you can do everything with nothing. And at that point, architecture would disappear. So he has an aspiration towards invisibility. This is architecture on the way out. Uh, but it's also kind of a, let's say, nuclear defense. This is no accidental image. On the left is the official government report on the bikini, bikini bomb, where in order to make understandable the forces at work, they place it against Manhattan. On the right-hand side, 1950, Collier's magazine is visualizing what it would mean an atomic bomb in Manhattan, and you see it's uncannily similar to the dome that Fuller produces. Fuller's very first kind of a project as a teacher is to ask the students to imagine that, that people have to evacuate from their, from their uh, houses in cities for, because of a nuclear catastrophe. Everything needed to produce a house needs to be able to put into a container that could be put on a truck to take you uh, somewhere else. You need then a shelter for that, and he, he invents for the first time the so-called necklace dome. So he imagines a kind of shelter from nuclear catastrophe, which is a lightweight frame 
with a kind of portable package for standardized living. It requires analyzing domesticity and finding every element of domestic life and making a kind of package for that. What's less well known is he immediately folded up that package and took it and displayed it in the courtyard of the Pentagon, the very first place he tried to pr promote the project uh, was to the Pentagon before he famously took it to Black Mountain College. And you see on the left is the first time a plastic skin is placed on that very same dome. And you see he's inside that once again with this thing radiating out, radiating out of his head. So here he is at Black Mountain College along with all the artists with his little package in his hand and his dome on the right, not telling everybody that it's simultaneously a military weapon and it's a kind of defense against the military. Or to say what I said from the beginning, and I'm only going to say the same thing like 100 times and you're already at number 25, there's no difference between defense against atomic warfare and shelter from atomic warfare because the, because the very concept of shelter has been what has been exploded uh, uh, by the bomb. 1953, he exhibits in the Museum of Modern Art the latest version of that very same house. You see it here. Uh, again, he, he gazes uh, uh, in, in astonishment at his own brilliance. Uh, and he says, to, he says to Time magazine, so this is not a kind of esoteric discussion in private uh, uh, discourse. This is the most public discourse possible in the Museum of Modern He says this is an appropriate uh, atomic uh, shelter. This is the very same year that he had been commissioned to make the ray domes, which were the, at the absolute epicenter of the United States defense against intercontinental ballistic missiles. Again, the, what, what better to house radiation, the radar, uh, than, than the ray dome? the dome. So again, um, is it attack, is it defense? It's, it's, it's both simultaneously. Second example, in the very same room where Fuller and his students, and there was never a project of Fuller that was not a student project, which then had his name attached to it. Likewise, Conrad Waxman in the very same room in Chicago at IIT, which as you know is a child of a child of the Bauhaus, so the American, the new American Bauhaus through Maholinage. Here's Waxman and his students mystified about what they have produced which is, of course, this astonishing hangar, which is almost one mile uh, uh, long, which is the mo one of the single most influential projects in the history of 20th century architecture. Less well known, you can see lurping, lur lurking down in the ground level there what seemed to be quite small, or actually the largest military aircraft ever produced, the B-36, which is designed to be able to more, almost permanently s move around the globe and drop atomic bombs on any place. In other words, this extraordinarily influential project, which which describes itself as very well shielded against defense because it's a nothing building. There are no floors, no roof, no ceiling, no windows. There's nothing of architecture left. Just a system that if you put a bomb through that system, it's easy, you can rebuild it. The whole thing can be built by uh, uh, labor with a single hammer. Right? So there is the idea of a kind of, again, a self-explosion of architecture, a kind of internal dematerialization in order to make old-fashioned warfare seem uh, irrelevant. But it's a center of, of a nuclear attack as you can see in the very first image published of this project, which was, again, an arts and architecture magazine, the same magazine that Beatrice is referring to. And you can see the ghostly shadow of these weapons of death housed by this non-house, which is a kind of a, 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 a space frame. These Buckminster Fuller and Vaxman are probably the two most influential figures in, in the experimental architectural tradition that goes through the late 50s, 60s, and early uh, 70s. I choose to show you only one aspect of that, which is Japan, because of course nowhere else was the, was the intimacy of dystopia and utopia felt more clearly than Japan. Here is Conrad Vaxman teaching a group of students in Tokyo in 1955. Sitting alongside him is uh, Kenzo uh, Tangi, the famous architect in Japan. Three or four of those students will, will become known as the metabolists uh, by 1960. 1955 is the year in which uh, Kenzo Tangi's project on the right to domesticate the horror of the uh, peace, so-called peace, peace park. So this image on the right, based on this original, this is 1945 to 1955, this is the moment which Vaxman is talking. Two of the students that are students of Vaxman had just edited this issue, which is a 10-year survey of architecture in the atomic age in Japan, which culminates with an interview between one of the would-be metabolists and a nuclear physicist about the relationship between architecture and nuclear energy. In other words, this conference was actually being held in 1950, the very conference we're having today was being held in 1955, just as Vaxman uh, uh, arrives. And the result for this, the first project that comes out of the metabolist, this is Kikitaki's floating city. Why floating city? Because the um, American Atoms for Peace project, including using nuclear weapons for architecture. So if I could blow up a mountain, then I would have a space to make a building. So they did a lot of experiments uh, on how to use nuclear weapons as a kind of architectural uh, device. 
The second proposal of that operation was to take away a mountain near Tokyo in order that Tokyo could expand. Kikutaku rejects that and instead offers this floating city, but this floating city is also using wave power, and the wave power is putting electricity into these columns, so these are vibrating with energy, but it also has a nuclear reactor. So in 1960, reacting to the atomic bomb and to nuclear energy is simultaneously this kind of defense and appropriation of the energy source. 1963, the first survey of the, what we would now think of as the experimental tradition and architecture is by Michel Rigon, and a huge part of his book is devoted to nuclear energy. He goes through all of the dystopia, all of the pot potential of suicide, but then goes through all the possible magnificent uses of nuclear energy, including using weapons to construct new kinds of city, and ends up with the conclusion that perhaps we will all be given at birth our own nuclear reactor, which will have sufficient capacity to be with us for the rest of our lives. So he simultaneously goes from, from the kind of horror of these weapons to the possibility that they are literally the kind of basis of, of uh, uh, domestic life. But in the book, he, he carefully maps how projects like the one on the right enable a new kind of architecture to be possible. Buckminster Fuller himself was not going to miss out, so when he did his tetrahedral city uh, for Japan, his client was in fact the, um, was the person responsible for bringing nuclear energy through a relationship with the United States to Japan. So of course this triangle has its own nuclear reactor. And this, uh, this is, by the way, as published in uh, Playboy, I think. Uh, I can give you endless examples, returning to Domus in Italy, 1969. This is a city for one billion people, which is nuclear powered. So let's say that generation of architects that's arguing for the overthrow of everything of the past. Remember Fontana, Lucio Fontana in 1951 in Milan has told a meeting of the mafia of modern architecture, including Le Corbusier and Gideon and all the others, that every concept of modern architecture was destroyed by the atomic bomb. So an entire new thinking is resulting. So that generation that is doing this thinking themselves are nuclear powered. So the reaction to the nuclear weapon is in fact like that. Again, this is Kenzo Tangi himself, which, by the way, in 1959 is teaching at MIT in Boston and is speaking loud and long about the beautiful qualities of nuclear energy. This is the person responsible for the planning after uh, Hiroshima, somebody who lost a number of his family, as did the metabolist, is then making a city with Fry Otto for Antarctica, uh, which has its own kind of nuclear uh, reactor. Essentially, what's happening is that, is that nuclear energy is acting as a kind of prosthetic that enables architecture to occupy different, different spaces, underground, underwater, the moon, the future, the past, in different ways. But it's a, it's a kind of prosthetic amplifier of an existing human species. In other words, it fits into a kind of much more 19th century understanding of technology. And just want to be careful that you don't, are not left with a feeling like there were these kids running around with nuclear energy in the 60s and 70s. This is 1956. Um, this is Frank Lloyd Wright presenting his mile-long skysc skyscraper in which the elevators are, as he said, atomic powered. And so basically this is, the atomic power is enabling this building to be much taller than ever. This building is, is extraordinary in 56. And it's a kind of, and you could say, well, it's just a kind of imagination, but it's literally a kind of, you could almost say mo in the most literal sense, a kind of prosthetic uh, 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 expansion of, of, of human arrogance. Maybe here a more complicated example, Paolo Soleri, a really awful person, by the way. I had the uh, disadvantage of meeting him in New Zealand, but truly, truly ho horrible person, megalomaniac. But here in, 1960, here in 1965 are the early versions of his Arcasanti project. And you can't quite see it, but in the bottom there's a nuclear power reactor in the base. But you see above is, is a Buckminster Fuller-like dome to protect yourself against radiation. And you see even written in there is the H-bomb blast. So he's visual, visualizing the arrival of a kind of negative radiation from above and a defensive system, but what you're defending is itself uh, uh, atomic power. Again, just to make sure we're not with stereotypes, this is Drop City, the very image with all their Bucky Fuller domes, this is the very image of counterculture. They wanted their own nuclear reactor. Right? In 69, they said, we want our uh, nu nuclear reactor. Okay, very fast, because all of this presupposes that, that nuclear energy was a kind of architectural prosthetic. It was not like added to architecture, but it was architectural in its quality and, and, and as it were, expanded um, human vulnerability and human uh, uh, violence. Here, of course, is the beginnings of the, of the Arte Nuclea group, uh, right, more or less right, right where, where we are. And you see um, uh, Enrico Barge, Joe, Joe Colombo, and Daniela, and they're making in 1951 this image on the right, which, as you can see, is a kind of confusion of a representation of, of, of sort of nuclei and sort of spinning uh, 
uh, microparticles uh, that are also a representation of the mushroom cloud, which are also a representation of some kind of being. This is an exhibited in the very first exhibition of, uh, uh, of the group in 1951, before they are even named as such. This is Joe Colombo, 1952, on the left. He's representing the, the shadows of Hiroshima, where a, de a dead person is, uh, the only trace of a dead person is coming from the shadow of the blast. And then he's doing images like the one on the right, where these kind of post-nuclear figures, or nucleated figures, are as it were almost underneath a tree that is itself, of course, a, a kind of atomic reaction, and is itself some kind of uh, uh, being. And then he's producing images like this, which are a confusion of all of, all of the above. So, so nuclear explosion as a new kind of animism, as a new kind of life. That is then turned into the cover of the 1952 exhibition. And you see on the right that in that exhibition of the nuclear, uh, uh, Barash has made two kind of post-nuclear sculptures or figures, new kinds of post-humanoids. And the shadow behind them, the nuclear shadow, has been uh, painted by Joe Colombo, who was a painter at that time. And look at one of those Colombo paintings. This is prefiguration in which the atomic clouds have started to form a kind of organism, which is also at the same time a kind of architecture. And in this, this image, very beautiful, he's making at that time, probably you know, he's making films with Enrico Barge, which are all about a kind of new kind of fluidity. It's almost like images of what came after architecture. Uh, and he calls this one architecture. It's not architecture singular, but architecture. So you're looking at whatever it is that, that post-nuclear architecture would be, or not really post-nuclear, nuclear architecture is, is, is exactly that. And in 1952, he starts to do his so-called nuclear city. You see it here, which has some of those kind of blobby qualities. Most of the city is underground, and the spheres are up, but actually it's more complicated. On a good day, you move your sphere up into the sunshine, and when there's a nuclear attack, you come back down, so a little bit sort of mixed meat. And then it's a sectional city. This is Milano. You recognize the cathedral and so on. So it's a new kind of urbanism that floats up there where, where there's a lot of vulnerability, uh, but it has the capacity to go, to go uh, deep down. Um, by the way, of course, he immediately stops being a painter, stops being a kind of thinker in that way, and via the figure of Asker Yorn, there's a direct relationship to Konstan Niewenhaus' New Babylon, more or less 1959 is the first image of the city of the future, which is atomic power. There are atomic reactors, but they're kept at some distance from this life. Again, what you're supposed to see in this image in the bottom, the first plans in the first section drawn in, this, in the Situations International Journal, is that there is no architecture as you would be familiar with. Again, very influenced by Conrad Waxman just to complete the orbit. Looking into it, I hope it's easy to understand this is a kind of internal explosion of architecture in which any assumption you would make about what is a space, but also what, would you, what you would imagine as a species. Uh, uh, this is a... This is a um, Constant said, I cannot represent the human because one doesn't know what the human would want for itself and whether it would be in any way human. And he also observed there's nothing really human about humans. Humans are the single most sort of obnoxious species on, on, the, uh, on the planet. Only when a child of a friend of his was sexually molested and the Vietnam War did he conclude that this was not paradise, but this would be a horror show, this would be Goya, this would be just mass. He did lots of images, very Goya-esque, called Massacre, where he would show the human species, if allowed to make itself anew uh, in collaboration with new technologies and new species and so on, would be murderous. This would just be filled with blood. So he runs away from the project. Not by accident, when Asker Yorn um, and Guy Debord make a manifesto in 1963 against underground life, their argument is uh, the, the call to go underground is a kind of fascistic call from government. One should resist this idea of shelter and, as it were, get one with the fact that we're not the same. Not by chance this is advertised for a new magazine that we're going to do called Mutant. So there is some idea of a kind of mutation of architecture and a mutation of architectural sensibility. Just because I promised you to get as far as Three Mile Island, this is Claude Perrant, one of the heroes of the experimental group, again, making this kind of nuclear-powered urbanism. From 1974 on, he's doing the actual projects for the domestication of the imagery of the nuclear plants of, uh, and these are not like idealistic, these were built, right? So I'm just showing you the kind of drawings. So one of the experimental avant-garde becomes responsible literally for domesticating nuclear energy. He is disowned by the experimental tradition. Nobody wants to have anything to do with him because this has happened. So Three Mile Island has, has produced this kind of sharp sense that any kind of love affair with the nuclear is toxic and toxic for experimentation. To conclude, Basically, the idea is that between 45 and 79, there's an extraordinary depth of thinking about the nuclear 
which is not, uh, okay, now the architect should join the conversation. It's a, it's a kind of understanding to what extent that was architectural. This is the drawings that Fuller was doing in order to produce the first dome. This is 1947. The drawings are only atomic, described as atomic, are very strictly based on mathematical arguments that he thinks are based on his own readings of Einstein. He's kind of calculating. If you read the text more thoroughly, you will see. So, so this is ha happening a long time before uh, uh, nuclear weapons. He then is able to imagine a dome, the one on the right, and his very first description of this house is atomic bulkalo. That's a typical, instead of bungalow, bulkalo. It has low bulk. It's almost nothing. It's almost invisible. So he's finally figured out how to make architecture disappear, but he does so in the name of radiation, and he's, he's of course, maybe you don't know, but he's arguing that we live inside electromagnetic vibrations. That is where we live. We perceive only an incredibly small part of it, so the architecture of the future is simply an architecture that understands the wider uh, sphere. His very first project on the left, so those were drawings of the 40s. Let's go back to the 20s. This is a 27, 28 drawing of his very first Dymaxion house, which is called the 4D house because he was a close reader of Einstein, and this is imagining the house as kind of ra as ra radiation in its form. And he always had cloud chamber images in his lectures and so on. You could say, yeah, but this is just architects kind of making a kind of science fiction. In fact, his first book of 1938 was ma mainly based on Einstein's relativity. The publisher thought he just, he's an architect, it cannot be right. So it was sent to Einstein to review. Einstein liked it actually and invited him to meet. And they spent a good day discussing uh, uh, the book. Well, not so stupid, uh, 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 Fuller. And again, don't give Fuller too many uh, credit points. Let's go back to Russia. Uh, Kutikov's uh, imaginary architecture of the future, which he describes as powered by infra-atomic energy. All I'm trying to say is that from the, at least from the 20s, there's a kind of response to Einstein. Again, uh, Kutikov, a reader of uh, uh, Einstein, all of us would have this little capsule on the left. Cities would be made if our capsules would gather together. Is there any real difference between this project and the Metabolist project of the 1960s? No. Right? You could only say that the difference is perhaps that in the 1960s there's a possibility of saying, yes, there's an atomic reactor uh, below, and yes, we've seen what atomic uh, uh, energy is. Uh, back to Vaxman, finally. This is Vaxman, who was, in fact, the person who designed the summer house for Einstein. They talked about it a lot. Uh, Vaxman always said to Einstein that there will be, from your theory, a new kind of architecture, a new kind of revolution, uh, uh, in, in architecture. Einstein kept saying, no, I don't think so, and I kind of like my summer house just the way you made it in wood uh, uh, by the water. Vaxman was not convinced. 1947 at Princeton, the entire mafia of uh, uh, Gideon and Neutra and Alto and Frank Lloyd Wright, everybody gathered together to discuss the future of modern man, not the future of architecture, but the future of modern man. And Vaxman said to them, it's all over, everything you ever thought because of atomic energy. In other words, there is in architecture a deep, deep vein of reflection upon uh, 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 on the nuclear, not because, and before that, the atomic, not because they're trying to be cool or interesting, but actually because implied in the very logic of the nuclear is a kind of architecture, or at least a threat to, to architecture as thought. To finish with 1953 comment, um, in 1953, uh, uh, Lewis Mumford said, ever since this image was produced, architecture has always been, as it were, under the shadow of the shadow of uh, radioactivity. In other words, radioactivity has been, at least uh, uh, from the production of this image in the late 19th century, uh, only possible to be thought there. So a little bit what I'm trying to say is it's so great to be here because I feel that all, all uh, you have done by inviting us here is invite a kind of return to a conversation which started in the late 19th century, is extraordinarily urgent, was urgent then, is perhaps even more urgent today. But as a historian, I have to say, hey, like Beatrice, Let's look a little bit at where we've come from, because if the question of clean has come back, exactly what Ragon says is, he quotes Arnold Schein, one of the most important of the experiment architects, who says, in the future, nuclear energy will be clean. So this idea of cleanliness and of efficiency and of modernity that's now attached to, let's say, a new, new, new uh, uh, technique of, of uh, nuclear uh, production, this, this is likely to liberate all sorts of fantasies in the architectural domain many of which will be incredibly stupid and not worthy of presentation at a lecture like this one. I hope it's clear that I think some of these are. Thanks. Because we are going to welcome to the stage uh, Michael Marder, who is a philosopher. 
um, and also Lea Persager, uh, a well-known artist. So please come to the stage. Thank you. Well, um, and just as a side note, actually, when we approach the topic of energy today, more often than not, we are talking about different sources of energy, different ways of procuring it. So whether it be it nuclear energy or so-called renewable energies or fossil-based energy, but we are not really asking what energy is. And I was very happy to hear uh, my colleague from fundamental physics, from the sciences, Stefano, uh, actually touch upon that more, uh, once again, fundamental question of the meaning or the being of energy. Uh, and uh, one word that is extremely important that Stefano actually mentioned this work. So energy not only does a lot of work, but it is work. And it is right there, this work is right there in the Greek uh, concept of energeia, in the word that Aristotle made up. This word did not exist in Greek, it's a neologism. So, uh, and uh, uh, he made it up by adding, by taking the root of ergon, which means work, uh, adding the prefix en, in or at, and the ending eia, which uh, substantivized this whole term, right? Uh, but uh, the notion of work is quite difficult, and I often say that we need to do a lot of work to actually get at the meaning of work. We have to work at this work quite carefully, because again, in the original locution, uh, work can mean the work process, the work that is being carried out, and the work that is done. There is a big difference between these two, what we, uh, in, in our modern discourse, call process and product, and all of that is folded into work even in the English word where it can be a work and also the verb to work. And uh, energy gathers together, it already creates, you see, its own conceptual semantic energy by gathering together these opposites within the same uh, semantic field of work, the process and the product, the open-ended movement and the destination or the purpose or the end to which it, it is moving. Um, and so my point is that um, energy creates its own conceptual field, which is uh, uh, quite dynamic and uh, 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 can invite different and very often oppositional senses. And I want very schematically, because this is uh, uh, just to give you a taste uh, of, of the idea that I want to propose, I want to uh, give you an overview, a historical overview from Aristotle to our day, so much more, <laughs> not only, um, not, not, not only a certain part of the 20th century, but from Aristotle to our days, based on, uh, again, a schematization of, this, uh, of transitions within the meaning of energy. Because Aristotle very curiously uh, insisted that energy, he never defined it directly, but indirectly he defined it by way of saying that energy is not potentiality. Energia is not dynamis. And this is quite important, is the origin of the very term energy. It is not potentiality. We, of course, we know now there is a term even potential energy, which is a, a, a concept in physics, and uh, which uh, actually undermines the very meaning of actuality. Any actual object, any actual body in the world is potential energy because it can be uh, in one way or another made to work, made to be transformed, made to transfer its energy to another state, whether we burn that body or do something else with it, right? It will release then the energy that it temporarily stores in itself, right? So any actuality becomes provisional uh, in, in our eyes based on this notion of uh, potential energy. Aristotle insists that energy is not potentiality, so it is actuality in that sense, 
And um, he gives us a way of thinking about energy uh, in, um, on, on the surfaces of beings. So everything that is, everything that presents itself in this world is energy. We don't need to drill and go deep and uh, break the atom to procure that energy. It is enough to look and to feel and to expose oneself to the surfaces of things in order to feel the circulations of energy itself, right? And uh, I will open a very short bracket here saying that um, for all the diversity of different sources of energy, uh, this philosophical approach allows us to uh, see common patterns. The common pattern uh, uh, being that we think that in order to procure energy, we have to appropriate the potentiality that things hold and in fact withhold from us. And in order to appropriate that potentiality, we need to break through the surface, to break through the shell of material being in order to extract that uh, valuable kernel of potentiality that it contains. And that can be, uh, that valuable kernel can be the energy that powers our uh, electrical devices, but it can be knowledge as well as the potential that is held within the actuality of beings. Uh, it can be value, uh, be it in the form of labor or in the form of money and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, this is what I would call the positive pole of the semantics or the conceptual semantics of energy. But there's also the negative pole or the negative charge, if we want to think in electrical terms. Um, and this negative charge uh, is what happens in modernity where, as in many ways, Aristotle is uh, uh, turned upside down and put on his head. And so the predominant meaning of energy is precisely not actuality, but potentiality, right? Uh, and this is what we, uh, when we are pressed finally to go beyond the different sources of energy uh, uh, to, to define or to describe its meaning, this is what we have in mind almost by default. Energy is pure potentiality. It is that uh, power that gives us the power to do anything that we want. So it doesn't have a pure end within it, it's a means. Uh, it's a pure potentiality that can allow us to accomplish uh, almost anything, almost like a magic wand uh, that, uh, uh, that, that can do our bidding. Um, and, and so, um, yes, so energy becomes the exact opposite of what Aristotle said it would be, but Aristotle himself actually prepares the grounds for this inversion, uh, even by way of his circuitous definition, when he says that energy is not potentiality, by this negation, not potentiality, he opens up the entire historical conceptual possibility for energy to be understood in this modern or hypermodern way as uh, a potentiality. So don't, where do we go from there? Um, uh, within my own philosophical work with the concept of energy, the first book from 2017, Energy Dreams of Actuality, uh, specifically built on the legacy of Aristotle and tried to reimagine energy as actuality in different domains of human existence, from economics uh, to theology uh, and, and even physics. Uh, and later on, uh, what I did was uh, develop a kind of dialectical understanding of energy with the help of Hegel, uh, who actually recovers Aristotle and um, uh, in a sense powers his dialectics by a constant movement of actualization and deactualization, which does the work of what uh, uh, Hegel calls spirit or geist. Uh, and so I think that the unblocking of the electrical current of energy as a concept entails putting these two parts together once again, not only in thinking, not only in our conceptualization, but historically and practically, combining uh, the uh, energy as potentiality and energy as actuality once again. Um, and uh, uh, just to conclude very briefly, uh, what exactly can philosophy do uh, to help this kind of uh, synthesis, uh, uh, creating the synthesis on which the, the fate of not only the human species, but perhaps of a, a livable world actually uh, depends. Uh, so the first point of this conclusion is that in the 21st century, uh, philosophical approach to energy is as indispensable as the one guided by physics, among other theoretical 
and empirical methodologies, uh, we have to ask this question, what is energy? The ontological question of energy. And without this philosophical lens, we will be just uh, speaking about alternative green sources of energy as a uh, colored facade uh, of something that remains exactly the same as before. Second, Despite a series of discontinuities, gaps, and even U-turns in the thinking of energy since Aristotle, its history is ultimately bound to the first emergence of energia. So it's important to go back to Aristotle, but without really saying that we can simply recover uh, uh, the meaning of energy that, uh, uh, that he gives us, but actually working uh, with it otherwise, given uh, our new realities in the 21st century. Third, just as the philosophical, theological, and scientific formulations and formalizations of energy are intricately interwoven, so the most mundane practices of procuring energy are inseparable from what at first glance appears to be high theory. In general, the activities and artifacts comprising our world are energy at work and in the work. And maybe this idea of nuclear architecture that we just heard uh, to make a, a, a link uh, is uh, the refusal of something that is in the work. So it's this uh, uh, idea that we should be constantly at the level of pure potentiality, constantly at work without ever reaching to even a temporary kind of uh, uh, um, uh, structure or, or artifact. It's the implosion of, of all artifacts. In particular, activities such as fracking and artifacts such as energy drinks are energy redoubled reflected into itself and expressive of our theoretical practical relation to it as to something to be extracted even and especially at the price of destroying that in which or those in whom it was temporarily stored. Fourth, and I'm really uh, uh, wrapping up here, there's nothing as lethal as a hypostatized potentiality. So, and, and I think this again links to the preceding two talks actually on uh, nuclear architecture. Once we, uh, what is that hypostatized potentiality? Once we uh, make potentiality our basic ontological principle, once we understand being itself as purely potential, rejecting any actualizations, we are basically striving in our uh, social ontologies, in our existence as such, into a kind of black hole uh, uh, of, of existence itself. And finally, uh, fifthly and finally, by reimagining the shapes that energy may assume today and into the future, philosophy would be reinventing itself. Uh, the fate of philosophy itself is very much tied to the question of energy as the question of being, while philosophers would be responding anew to the ancient injunction, know thyself. It is not only a matter of envisioning greener, more sustainable forms of energy production, but also, and above all, of creating the ground upon which these axiological judgments are made within the logic of means and ends informed by evolving energy configurations. So taken in its deepest sense, exceeding the scope uh, of uh, the, and the time that I have uh, allotted uh, for me here, philosophy and energy, and, and the fate of, uh, of both philosophy and energy, are really completely entwined with one another and can be understood through uh, each other. Um, and the, these are the concluding thoughts I want to leave you with. Yeah, thank you. Super. Oh, I have to hold this. Um, I have to shift here. Oh, it's there. Okay, do you hear me? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, being part of this. It's really um, amazing. I've been looking forward to this for uh, a long time, and it's, yeah, it's beyond. Um, so uh, I will try to just go through uh, my own very uh, unscientific approach to uh, <laughs> energy uh, and, and try to present some glimpses into the way that I try to work with these uh, um, yeah, excites, excitement and exhaustions within both particles, physics, uh, tantric technology and also feminist theory, I would say. Um, so basically I am driven by uh, a yearning to these strange and also uh, risky intimacies. So um, I decided to um, 
actually, instead of going directly for uh, all the nice things that you can say about particles when you're an artist and you try to speculate around them and you discover that, for instance, neutrinos are left-handed and that they are traveling to, through space and they oscillate and they have queer personalities or identities and all these kind of things, or you discover that uh, even scientists has these spiritual uh, hidden sites. Um, I thought, okay, what do I have that are very concrete in relation to energy? And I decided then to uh, show you a few images from uh, Stripped, which was uh, an exhibition that I made for Moderna Museet uh, in Stockholm, and later uh, it moved on to um, Copenhagen at Charlottenburg, and uh, it was uh, curated by Lars Bang Larsen. And of course, to present this here, it's also to present another kind of energy producing machine. So you have the windmill, and this windmill is then cut into these pieces. Um, and I guess it was also a way for me to situate myself as a child of this new anti new clear movement, basically, and a child of wind technology. So uh, I thought, okay, this is really where I come from. Uh, so to also cut these blades was also a way to maybe question some of the limitations that are in wind energy. Uh, coming from Denmark, where we are super proud of the wind technology, it, it was also a bit like risky to uh, deal with uh, such a heavy symbol. It's like Wheel of Fortune, nearly, for, for uh, the Danish government. Uh, but on the other hand, it was uh, a way to sort of also describe uh, some of the waste. We have been speaking a lot of waste, and of course there are this problem with uh, glass fiber that it's really hard to uh, to um, use again, and and therefore, it they are now, in a way, worn out. Many of the the smaller windmills. I also grew up with a windmill in the backyard. So uh, coming from this very hippie type of uh, approach to energy, uh, my my then later uh, love with particles was, uh, in a way, nearly dirty in itself. So, um, okay, um, so I, I, when I decided to, uh, to cut these blades, it was also a way to, of course, take them down to earth and also to, in a way, see if I could make uh, portals into other worlds. That is a theme in my practice in general that I try to combine these uh, high te technologies with maybe uh, something that are more loaded in the spiritual realm. So, uh, uh, yeah, as you will see in a minute, we will have these up against uh, a film that are driven by not a normal wind, but actually the very controversial idea that uh, we have the uh, a wind called the dark matter wind, and I felt that was such a beautiful uh, metaphor uh, for uh, being exposed to a wind that we don't really understand. And this wind is not really a wind, so it's uh, it's this breeze of something that we cannot grasp yes, yet. Uh, and um, and thinking about this, I, I also thought, okay, uh, now that this is really fast, I I, I just felt like instead of me being extremely nervous, we can maybe just have a little moment of meditation together with this uh, animation. So now we will just play it with uh, sound, um, the next uh, film. So we just uh, have a few minutes of uh, meditating <laughs> together with these uh, winds. Are you doing something now? Har, 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 har
Just speaking into uh, this idea of trying to uh, combine these uh, more like spiritual ideas with, of course, a technology like wind technology and particle theory. That is really the promiscuous play that I, that I believe is also, in, in, at least to me, um, generates this scene for uh, trying to uh, deal with energy, that energy is not only something outside of us, of course, but uh, it needs to be touched on all levels, so to speak. Uh, and of course, it, it feels like um, playful and, uh, and also promiscuous to some the, to combine these uh, ideas or misunderstandings of scientific ideas like dark matter wind that we don't really know what is but it just happened that there was this uh, peak of dark matter wind at the same time as the, the Pentecost so it was also like speaking in tongues so suddenly the speaking in tongue be became this way of also trying to go out in these domains in a different way um, and then uh, another another uh, theory that I was very inspired of uh, in relation to uh, particles is of course also the, um, the idea of um, bare and dressed particles, uh, that you need to sort of dress particles to understand them because the naked particles are the infinite particle uh, and I just felt that that was really uh, beautiful. Uh, then now we have a the text part that then leaves us into uh, a part that are much more like organic, but is still dressed, uh, as you will see in a minute. So uh, it's all the time about trying to get closer to some sort of energetic feeling inside or sensation or synthesize things or matters that are maybe normally very distant, uh, and then try to see if, if they can somehow then transform into another kind of energy in a different domain. See you in a few more minutes. might be very um, visual <laughs> that uh, that my uh, way or my way of dealing with physics stems from a very unorthodox source namely uh, kundalini yoga and tantric theory and also theosophy uh, so this idea that physics can be many things but 
Of course, in the 60s uh, and the 70s, a lot of uh, spiritual movements, they sort of just hijacked all the quantum terms to, uh, in a way, say this is uh, true. What we have talked about so long is true. Um, and of course, that's highly uh, yeah, it problematic as well, because uh, they left out also maybe some of the more uh, un understood and uh, problematic aspects of quantum physics. So, okay, I will move on. The next uh, slide that I want to show is uh, where my interest is at the moment, where I uh, have the privilege of uh, doing a postdoc, uh, where I try to see if I can go deeper into uh, land art pieces that are inspired by uh, physics. And uh, then I thought I would like to show you uh, the memorial I did in uh, Sweden for uh, the tsunami in 2004, Southeast Asia, uh, which was uh, inspired by gravitational waves. Uh, and it's called gravitational ripples. And for me, it was a way, again, to transform these ideas of the particle physics, astrophysics, into uh, something that you could actually walk into, into something that has to do with some of the emotions that you were uh, trying to deal with in a memorial. And uh, of course, uh, gravitational waves are bending space-time itself, which is, of course, a beautiful image on, on how uh, grief could be uh, thought of. And the last one, sorry, I'm getting so confused. It's probably all the energy in the house. <laughs> the, the last one is called uh, Clit or uh, Dune. And uh, it's uh, it departs from um, the double slit experiment. So there's actually a small double slit in the middle of the site. But again, it was a way to uh, make a, a shore biotope in the middle of the city and then create a landscape that departs from uh, particle physics and again to generate a space that you can actually go into that are from for other of course species as well and to in a way then have this biodiversity uh, to uh, to blossom in in the site yeah it's a little hard to see the double slit and there was also references to uh, to different uh, other concepts in in quantum physics. So uh, yeah, so that was my very confusing, but uh, still um, yeah, with a lot of inner energy <laughs> uh, presentation. And uh, thanks again for um, yeah having me. Thank you, Leah. Um, da, um, we are going to watch a uh, recorded contribution um, of artist and writer uh, Kate Crawford, um, who unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, we had the pleasure to meet her uh, yesterday when we went to, to see the, the power plant in Trino Vercellese, and we have a recording of her speech for you. Thank you. Admiring your work in um, AI for a very long time, and uh, I'm really happy that um, you could um, come and share with us your thoughts about this subject. You've been studying uh, energy resources and AI for a very long time, and I would like to know what brought you to these questions. Mm. Well, of course, artificial intelligence as a field uh, is often very narrowly and technically prescribed. It focuses on algorithms, on mathematical approaches, on the cloud, and there's been generally very little uh, discussion or research on its material imprints. And so that has been something that has been the center of my work uh, for the last seven years. Uh, and to, to really understand the materiality of artificial intelligence required going to the places of its extraction. So I, I've traveled to mines around the world to study the supply chains of lithium and rare earth, and then to look at the energy requirements for planetary scale artificial intelligence, which as we know are vast and growing. 
So with the new approaches in artificial intelligence like generative AI, these are even more energy intensive than the previous discriminative AI forms. So part of my work really is, is tracing what we can know but also tracing what we don't know. Uh, and of course, one of the things that's most troubling about this field is that so much of the data around energy use is kept as the, the, the most guarded corporate secrets. So sometimes this means having to do FOIA requests, you know, going to physical sites to sort of track their energy and water usage patterns for data centers. Um, it's, it's very empirical work in that sense. I'm in particular interested um, in the questions of full supply chains of natural resources and AI. What have you recently learned? What are the new developments? In mm. Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, certainly for my last book, Atlas of AI, it was really developing a, a sort of a typology of the full resource stack of artificial intelligence. So, you know, in my thinking around this area is, is certainly that AI is, is really the extractive industry of the 21st century. It relies on vast amounts of data, hidden human labor, and natural resources. And we can break that into different domains. We can talk about energy, we can talk about water, and we can talk about minerals. So we really sort of have to think about it in this sort of tripartite way. But certainly the, the full stack now is starting to shift. And one of the things that I found really interesting is looking at the chipsets uh, that are being used to drive generative AI. So right now, of course, Taiwan is at the center of uh, the world's attention and at the center of geopolitical AI production um, because it, it really is the hub for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, and so we can look at NVIDIA's chips, the H100 and the A100. Currently, there's a global shortage of these chips because they're in such high demand. So all of the large tech companies um, you know, have at least 200 to 300,000 of these chips running their AI stacks. But each one of these chips uh, has an extraordinarily energy intensive production cycle. Um, we can look to the global wafer production that's produced by TCSM, also in Taiwan. This is hugely energy intensive to produce these wafers because of the high precision tooling needed to make them. Uh, and again, it's always energy and water paired. So in the case of TCSM, they use around 60,000 uh, gigaliters of water um, per day. And, and that's around 10% of the two major uh, water reservoirs, which also essentially create the public water supply for residents. Um, and that's 10% of each reservoir. So that's an enormous amount of water. And that sort of sets the scene from the beginning of the, of the full stack of AI as we sort of trace down. We can think about the chipsets, then we go into the creation of the data centers and all of the hardware and water needed to cool it, which is extraordinary. And then through deployment, when these models are actually facing us and we're sitting there with our text boxes and typing in prompts, here too is an enormous amount of energy. So this is, for me, part of the sort of the, the process of critical cartography in AI is like, how do we map and trace all of these points in which these enormous energy guzzling systems are, are functioning and, and, and where they're drawing on supplies? And the interesting thing, of course, is that, again, so little of this is publicly reported. And can you tell us a little bit more about uh, new developments in green computing? Because, of course, there's a lot of conversa conversation about the fact that, uh, in general, computing industry, um, computer technologies are creating about 2% of the carbon uh, footprint. Probably it's higher, but the most recent calculations are about that. And there are many attempts to already, like, obviously think about on the one hand the how much uh, carbon footprint is generated by this industry and how to reduce it how to create more um, uh, energetically um, sustainable uh, technologies and also how to take care of the electronic waste so um, uh, what, what are the newest developments that you are aware of well it's interesting because uh, right now the tech industry is slightly behind aviation, but only very slightly in terms of its full carbon footprint. Uh, but because of its growth rates, which are exponential at the moment, it is predicted to actually lap aviation very shortly. So there's a lot of attention on how to make uh, computing greener. 
Um, but it's an extremely dirty supply chain. Um, again, if I think of projects that I've done, like anatomy of an AI system, uh, we were really sort of tracing where the waste products go um, from, from so many of these systems. And you can actually you know, go and see them. You can go to Batu in Mongolia and see these vast lakes that are you know, five miles wide. I mean, these are just gigantic black lakes of toxic mud that are produced from mining all of the rare earth. Um, because, of course, rare earth is quite common in the earth's crust, but the practice of extraction is extremely uh, waste intensive. So you, you have not just the kind of tailings, but you also have an enormous amount of radioactive slurry that's produced in rare earth mining that end up in these artificial lakes. I mean, again, you see the imprints on the earth all the way through the supply chain. So in terms of the things that I've seen that I'm excited about, um, right now we're looking at sort of different model designs in large language modeling. Uh, and there's a new open source model called Bloom that was actually only using around 5% of the energy that was used to train GPT-3. Uh, we don't know GPT-4 because, of course, it's become another black box. They've released nothing about how it was produced. But for GPT-3, we know a few things. And what Bloom did, which is interesting, is that they didn't use uh, any of the traditional coal and gas energy pipelines uh, to train this system because it was all trained in France. So they ended up using nuclear. Now that you know, meant that it was a much sort of cleaner sort of net training process for Bloom. But then of course we have all of the questions that nuclear raises. And you know, certainly it, it always makes me think of Peter Gallison's work uh, in his fantastic documentary Containment where he traces the waste for nuclear energy production. And it's, it's still something that we don't have answers for. And I know that one of the things for this conference is focusing on how this could be done differently and done better. But at the moment, we don't have those solutions. So uh, even in the case of Bloom, so-called green AI, I think, hides a different story. And, and it really requires sort of unearthing and excavating all of those full stack supply chain questions to really start to assess if something is green or not. And what is your biggest concern about um, energy and AI? Honestly, my biggest concern about energy and AI is that people aren't talking about it, that it's assumed that this is, you know, somehow a clean technology that's, you know, just operating in the background, you know, in a cloud server with, with no impact on the environment whatsoever. Um, in fact, generally speaking, when people talk about AI, it's because it will be used to somehow solve the climate crisis. People say, oh, yes, AI will take care of this, when actually it's contributing to all of the things that we're most concerned about environmentally right now. So I think that the thing that's undergirding a lot of this is, is just effectively the problems of secrecy. So at the moment, uh, what is being published around energy usage is very general uh, from the tech sector, um, and there's very little sort of precise information. Um, again, because partly there's concerns that this will be a competitive advantage to know how much energy is being used. But honestly, the numbers are just going up and up and up. That's all we know, is that there's just like a huge uh, energy demand particularly for generative models. So, and the same is true of water. Um, there we have you know, a few more uh, sources of information, uh, which is fantastic, but what we're seeing is that the amount of water need to cool these gigantic data centers is extreme. A recent paper, in fact, um, estimated that every exchange you have with GPT, you know, on chat GPT, talking about you know, something that's interesting to you that day, just as to, you know, effectively to play. Um, and those, those games that we play with GPT are the equivalent of pouring out a liter of fresh water on the ground for every exchange, just because of the amount of cooling that's done in servers. So it, it really casts a different pall on what we're doing here um, and, and what these, these LLMs and large language models are, are actually doing to the planet more generally. So I think you know, my concern is that, that you know, if we pull away the curtain and you start to see the full stack resource implications, they're pretty horrifying. Um, and it does require the industry to rethink how it's actually creating artificial intelligence from the large-scale training data sets that drive these models through to essentially the, the embodied carbon in everything from the chipsets to the full builds to the actually you know, deployed models. 
we can only imagine what's going to happen with quantum computing when this is going to be essentially uh, on a very different level. And um, are there already any conversations even about how we might be prepared for that? Agnieszka, I think that will be the topic for the next conference. <laughs> it's such a big one, but um, but I know you and I find that really interesting. And certainly some of the conversations about quantum uh, are really focusing on will it will it really shift the sort of energy equation in a in a positive direction for us? Uh, and it's too it's too soon to call clearly, um, but it's certainly fascinating because I think so many of the the ways of thinking about how AI is made materially are going to change. Uh, so, as we say, might be um, that might be the conference for 2035. What do you think? I think so. Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us. Such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>
every once in a while, a lot of people die. You know, and the life expectancy goes down. However, you can compare Italy to all these other countries. There's a whole bunch of them here. You see that despite the fact that they had terrible world wars, two of them, on their own soil, Italians remarkably good at living a long time. Kind of astonishing how skillful they are. Really, as opposed to, say, post-Soviet Eastern European mortality crisis, which is something I witnessed, quite a terrible business. Okay, this is Europe getting older, older people in bigger cities with a lot of sky to be afraid of. <clears throat> this is the rest of this century and now to the next century, the 22nd century. Okay, nothing particularly shocking here. It's just moving along at the same pace that it has during my entire lifetime. There's not a lot different in this late 21st century demographic. The one thing that's really kind of weird about it I mean, historically unparalleled, big hordes of women over 100 years old. Really a lot of women, you know, and, and some men, but mostly women, because really a lot of women, a whole lot of women, well over 100 years old. And if you're a young woman in the audience now, this is your cohort. You're going to be older than anybody has ever been in bigger cities, and you'll be more afraid of the sky. That's your future. Okay, United States, I'm happy to be an American guy. I have to toss this in here. How are they doing on the life expectancy ranks? Terrible. Really bad. They're in an Eastern European-style demographic decline here. Why are they dying off deaths of despair, You know, especially as compared to Italians, Europeans, and so forth? It's just really pretty bad. Um, it's a big cultural problem. I mean, you, you might think that getting old is a big cultural problem. Dying younger is a big cultural problem. <laughs> Do not take any health advice from anybody in the United States. They're quite badly off, seriously. I mean, you should listen to the Americans. Do the opposite of whatever they say. Okay, enough about the oldness. Now let's talk about the cities, because Italian cities are of great interest to me. I really love this beautiful map here. Okay, big cities, where are they? Well, these are the big ones, the big spiky ones. Napoli, Roma, Milano, Genova, Torino, a particular favorite of mine. One of the things I really like about Torino is that it lost a third of its population. So it's the opposite of cities always getting bigger, right? If you go to Torino, you can see like, Everybody just left. I mean, like a third of everybody was gone, and they sort of like climbed back. That's a process I find of tremendous interest. But you can also see that although Italy has some quite big cities, it doesn't really have a Tokyo or a Mexico City. It doesn't have like a gigantic Calcutta, out of control, booming megalopolis. In fact, although the national government of Italy isn't something that Italians like to brag about, the the cities are actually rather well managed. They're like super popular with foreigners. Everybody wants to go. And even Torino, which had basically zero tourism, managed to pull itself around by becoming a big tourist draw. I just sort of said, all right, well, let them come. And, you know, and sure enough, they just poured in. It's a fascinating thing to watch. I pay all kinds of attention to it. I and mean, there they are, you know, and they're, they're super popular with foreigners. Foreigners really admire Italian cities. They just, they can't get enough of them. They're not desperate cities. I mean, these are actually quite inventive and capable places, you know, with a lot of innovation and some sort of serious thought about urban issues. Okay, enough about the oldness in the cities. On to some weather reports. They're bad. These are Italian weather reports, really bad. Everything too hot, stuff catching fire, lots of floods. Just terrible, terrible weather all over Italy. Worse than ever. It's the hottest year ever recorded. It's, it's pretty bad. I mean, you've got a lot to be afraid about with the sky in Italy, and there's no place to hide. There's no safe place in this peninsula. Everything has some kind of menace. Some are worse than others, obviously. Okay, it's, these are kind of maps. I mean, they look... They look a bit abstract. What's it like to live this? Okay, this is Ischia. This is a super typical Italian reaction to climate crisis, by the way. Will it frighten the tourists? Okay, what about the people on the island? To hell with the tourists. Nobody cares if they're safe. Okay, this is Ischia, which is that rock. Okay, if you're on a rock in the middle of the Mediterranean, 
and you get a tremendous amount of rain, like a year's worth of rain in a day, parts of your rock will fall off. I mean, that's what happened here. Big chunk landslide, chunk of the island, got too wet, peeled right off, fell in. There were some people nearby. It's a lot of trouble. Okay, there's going to be more of that. Lots more. whole lot more. It's going to be super typical. This is Italian geography. This is what it looks like. You get a whole lot of rain. There's nothing you can do about it. Next to nothing. You're going to put wire all over this island, cover it in concrete. There's no way. It's going into the Mediterranean. And the tourists, they don't actually care. And people said that the tourists would be afraid of COVID-19 in Italy because Italy, as you may know, had one of the earliest and most fatal outbreaks of COVID-19. The tourists don't give a damn. They care nothing about the danger. You can stop worrying about the tourists. You worry about what's actually happening to you and how that looks on a European scale. All right, the Europeans are practically in as much trouble as you. Italy has some geographic special problems because it is a peninsula. It's exposed to, a, you know, the sea on both sides, rising seas is a problem. It's got a lot of mountains. Um, but yeah, these are, these are, I mean, the wolf is at the door here. I mean, and this is actually, this is, this is the good old days of the 21st century. This was the hottest year ever recorded, but this is very mild weather by 21st century standards in Italy and Europe. I lost everything. Okay, a day doesn't go by without a melancholy weather report of this kind somewhere. And, and your people minding their own business, harmless in market. Here come the floods, gigantic amount of water. Everything washes away. I lost everything. Okay, you know, the reaction is we must feel sorry for this person who lost everything. Okay, that's not what's actually going to happen under conditions of old people in big cities afraid of the sky. It's you who loses everything. It's the city that loses everything. The museum will wash away. The library will wash away. The police station will wash away. It's not like the individual sad person. Okay? If you want to do anything about that, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you don't want to lose everything, don't put it in one place. Try to scatter it, but also just try to own fewer things because they don't really make you wealthy. They're just very risky now, and they're going to get more and more risky. If you've got a whole lot of expensive stuff, the chances of you losing all of it is going way, way up. Way up. And Italy has this particular interesting situation because it has so many of these historical buildings it's supposed to protect. And, you know, the UN brings money, and this is something that Italy has that no other country has. These places will be damaged. The water will hit them. They will catch fire. There will be droughts there. Medicanes will hit them. They're going to go underwater. I mean, we're in a building of that description right now. It, it's a pretty well-placed building. I mean, it's not going to flood like Rivoli might flood because it's up on a hill and it's got like big heavy walls around it. It's very solidly built. I would worry a lot about the basement. Now, water can penetrate this building. It could pool in here. It could start ruining stuff. A building like this might be super valuable in the future because you can kind of fortify it. You could make it like a nuclear plant for whatever it is you're trying to save. But a lot of the stuff you're trying to save is not going to be saved. It's going to be ruined. And these are precious areas to you. They're already ruins, a lot of them. But they're going to get ruined again. And then you have to make the decision, how many times are we going to continue to restore this ruined building? And to what how much energy do we want to put into it? I mean, if we're in the Castello de Rivoli, do we want it to look like an art building? Do we want it to look like an actual castle? Do we need to make our museums into castles? These are all decisions that you're going to have to make, and you're going to have to make them repeatedly because they'll get ruined again and again. It's not that you, they get smashed and you fix them and it returns to the status quo ante. They get smashed and you fix them and they remain in a very risky 21st century native situation. Th these are beloved places. Uh, the, the, the tourists love them, okay? I mean, the tourists love most of them. They're, they're precious to mankind. Everybody says so. They're, they're very risky. They're not as risky as Libya. Okay, Libya happens to be a country which is very much in the Italian cultural and economic orbit. This is the worst flood, or at least the most deadly flood of the 21st century. 
This is the most deadly flood of the 21st century so far. Okay, you know, I, I don't want to dwell on how awful it is to find 10,000 dead people in your town and have a third of the town wash out to sea. I'm just saying that the geography of Italy is quite similar to the geography of North Africa, and there are a lot of dams. I mean, what happened here was that they got a Medicaine super flood, you know, a year's worth of rain in a couple of days, and it just overloaded two dams, which had been built in the 1980s. So there was two hydro hydrodynamic dams worth of water that broke and went through the town and threw the town into the sea. Okay, the Po has a lot of dams on it. In fact, you need more dams in a situation where you have droughts and floods, because if you have a drought, you need the water, and if you have the flood, you need the dam to protect you from the floods. So of course you want to build the dams, that's perfectly sensible, but if the dams themselves are destroyed, you're gonna lose the town and the river valley. Okay, this is a very typical 21st century problem. You know, and this is gonna happen quite often. It, it, people won't become numb to it or anything, but you know, it, it's just, it's, just uh, it, it's typical of what is waiting for us. And I would also point out that say, if a nuclear power plant had killed 10,000 people and washed a third of the, uh, destroyed a third of the town, you would hear no end of it. But this is fossil fuels and water power. Water and fossil fuels wrecking this very unfortunate and very old, by the way, this historic, very handsome Libyan town. Kind of a shame. Okay, so what does the future of Italy feel like under these circumstances? All people, big cities, afraid of this guy. Kind of a lot of sky to be afraid of, like more than scientists were forecasting, kind of getting pretty bad. I would, I would argue for Napoli. Because you know, Napoli's got volcanoes, and it's kind of always had volcanoes, and it doesn't have a lot of monuments or a lot of UNESCO World Heritage stuff, mostly because it burns up or gets ashes all over it, and there's also a whole lot of earth tremors that just kind of smash stuff up. Okay, I would point out that even though Napoli is exceedingly dangerous, and you would wonder why any sane person would want to live on a volcano, in a heavily seismic zone, Italians have been doing that for four or 5,000 years. I mean, you go hang out with Napoli people, they, they're not particularly concerned. I mean, they know their lives are dangerous. They don't really fuss about it that much. They know it's expendable. Stuff gets knocked down. It is a seismic city. Periodically, the earth shakes, smells of sulfur. How about a really good pizza? That's, that's what people say, and enjoy our culture. That's what they say in Napoli. See Napoli and die. How old are you? Are you 100? You'll probably die pretty soon. All right, you know, and, and it's easy to say, well, we, well, Milano must be the future because, you know, Milano is like very wealthy and very high tech, a lot of education, and Vesuvius is, you know, the, the Napoli region is rather poor, and, you know, it, it's kind of beautiful in some ways. Uh, but I'm thinking... You should think more about Napoli and sort of get your head around the idea that that's you. Like Milan is actually more like Napoli than Napoli is like Milan. I mean, Napoli is not dangerous in the way that, I mean, Milan is not dangerous in the geothermal way that Napoli is dangerous, but it's going to be dangerous in new climate crisis ways. And those will be felt. Okay, here's your energy heritage of this century, been going quite a long. It's rather flexible, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at how much initiative Italy has have been able to do. I mean, people, people talk about it. Italians being rather, you know, stodgy and kind of, they can't seem to do anything. I, this, is, this is an example of quite a lot of flexibility here. Things are kind of just moving right along. And it's actually, energy use actually going down, right? I mean, just, they don't even need to use as much. And uh, that blue stuff, the coal and the natural gas, that is fatal, very bad. Those mean you're ruined. You gotta get rid of those. I mean, in Ukraine, where they have this energy war or the energy terror, as the Ukrainians like to call it, they basically had all their power plants blown up, just singled out, blown up. That's actually a kind of hopeful notion in my book. 
if you can blow up a country's entire power structure and they kind of rebuild it in like a matter of months while they're being shot and bombed and there's like cruise missiles in there, that shows that there's like a lot more resilience in building new energy than people would let on. It's quite possible to build something very new even in conditions of great turbulence. And I think Italians could actually do this. I think they could just get to carbon zero and kind of by whatever means necessary. Uh, yeah. So uh, one final thing, because I am a science fiction writer and people really expect this from us. You gotta have some super high-tech weirdness, you know, or people, people think you're getting too serious. So this is my last thing here, and I, I say this for Italians. Okay, this is, this is an idea that's well over a century old, which is damning the Mediterranean. Okay, why do you want to put a dam on Gibraltar and turn the Mediterranean into a European lake? Well, if you don't, at the end of the century, Italian cities on both coasts are going to be going underwater. I mean, they're going underwater pretty fast. And that means Genova, Bari, Trieste, Venezia, all those others, big chunks of your favorite seaside. That give, Let's go to the beach. It's Ferragosto. There's no beach, okay? There's nothing. So this is Atlantropa, a hundred-year-old plan to terraform the Mediterranean and save all the port cities in the Mediterranean. You just build this high dam, you can, you can generate power with it. It's only seven kilometers across. I mean, it's been dammed up before. You'd have to go dam the Suez Canal. You'd have to put locks in it, like in the Panama Canal. But you could, in theory, you know, and this is an old idea. They, they did the math. Engineers did the math 100 years ago. It's, it's completely conventional technology here. You don't need fusion and artificial intelligence. You need a bunch of rocks. Bunch of rocks and trucks, you just dump rocks into the water until the water can't get in. All right, when you look at this seriously, it, it looks very similar to that bizarre atomic energy architecture we were looking at earlier. It, it's very 1970s super architecture. There's nothing actually super about it. I mean, what's super about it is looking at it and thinking that you might actually have to do it. And how on earth would you negotiate such a thing? I mean, this is a very simple act of geoengineering. You're not really saving yourself from the Medicanes or any of the rest of it. You're just saving Venezia. And, you know, if you save Venezia, I'm sure it would be worth more to the state of Italy than the entire cost of building this big chunk of rock, even if the Italians did it all by themselves. And obviously they wouldn't. They'd have to, like, get come up with some kind of bizarre political coalition with the Lebanese and the Libyans and the Tunisians and the French and the Spanish and every possible person from the Middle East, some of the world's least cooperative people, you'd have to go on and tell them, well, we've decided to just dam off the Mediterranean because, you know, otherwise we're going to lose all this stuff. All right, if you don't do it, you're going to lose the Mediterranean. I mean, your, your port cities will be underwater and mostly they'll be covered with plastic just floating stuff from all the other drowned cities that just wash up. That, without a solution on this caliber, that's the future of the Italian peninsula. It's probably technically doable. It's much cheaper than trying to build dikes around Genoa, Bari, Trieste, Veneta. That's never going to work. It would cost more than this. Imagining actually building it, it's quite daunting. It would be much, much better and cheaper to just do less damage. Frankly, if we went to, if we went to, to carbon zero tomorrow, we'd still be facing hell to pay with the climate and the seas rising. But we never learned that. However, as the damage gets worse, we'll have to learn it, and that's what we're going to spend this very interesting century doing so thank you for your attention. Well, well, now I understand why I invited you to this conference, finally. Because uh, I think that science fiction writers are actually, as most of us think, prefigurers of what happens, uh, like H.G. Wells, for example and you, and a couple more. And the reason I'm sitting behind here was not just to, to laugh uh, it, it, towards the audience at your jokes, but was because uh, your work as a writer of 30 years ago, or uh, uh, 
informed how I saw Adrian Villarojas' work when I came across a young artist who built a whale out of unfired clay on the bottom of Patagonia that had washed up along the coast that nobody would see under a forest except for a few scattered human beings uh, in the lowest part of Earth before Antarctica as a survivor of a future world where the world had gone underwater and then somehow had melted and somehow had come washed back up onto that beach and he made it. To make a long story short, so, the, um, so that is why we're all sitting here on this stage. So Adrian, what I'd like to, to start you off, you don't need me to speak, but I wanted to suggest that you might explain why. I mean, you were in the Extinction Marathon in Serpentine many years ago, in my Documenta many years ago, and before that also in Argentina making works that spoke about a post-apocalyptic world or oh, an, an, a kind of adolescent sci-fi imagination of a world after the world, but somehow there were humans and in that world or some species, in that some species that were huddled together, they were not firing clay, but they had fire again as if the future of this post-apocalyptic world were a world with with fire and some sort of sexual relationship with Neanderthals, or maybe not. Um, so fire and unfired clay in your work. And that went on and on and on to become this extraordinarily kind of optimistic oeuvre around compost and composting and sticking stakes into cement blocks on the High Line in New York and leftovers from restaurants in New York and, and making strange life, biological life in an exhibition, for example, in your solo show in London some years after. So I, I know you now, I mean, I know two artists who are somehow really involved in this in very, very opposite and different ways. One is Pierre Huig and, and one is you, in completely opposite ways. But this idea of composting life, uh, it, composting life in a post-apocalyptic moment, which is the imaginary system that you brought and somehow canonized in contemporary art. And we are so grateful to have your work here at the Castello di Rivoli, two works actually, you know, uh, one which is on long-term loan from the Fondazione Ceriti for Latte, which is the, one of the animals that escaped uh, the earth and then escaped the sea to come back to the earth of the Istanbul Biennale. And the other is a fossilized uh, tree with a dead bird on it. But that speaks of death, but speaks also of life. So uh, I don't know how to continue from the dam, except that I really like this idea of making the dam. I would like to find some funders and I would like to make a new like documenta on the seven kilometers and we could just run the whole thing in my old age. But I think it's a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant idea. Um, hello? Hello, hello. Is Slide. it working? Uh, um, I think we, we're gonna need the clicker. This, the uh, clicker. And thank you so much for this beautiful uh, presentation, Caroline. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody. Thanks for the invitation, Agnieszka and Caroline and the sponsors. And thanks everybody for your time, for listening to us, uh, to all of us for so much, I mean, so long, which is a, it's a beautiful chamber of listening to each other, which is many times very difficult, right, to, to listen to, to others talk. So, um, yeah, I think when I'm, just to answer hopefully very briefly to this context of how I displace my work and most of what I do, if not all, to this space time where perhaps human species is not longer around, and many times I, I, I think about that and, and ask myself, at probably now at 43, I have better answers that, than when we met and I was probably 30 at that time. So I think that I cannot disconnect myself from the history of my country, I'm Argentine, Argentine Peruvian. So I'm a person who was uh, actually born in a country that was going through a di dictatorship 
with 30,000 disappeared people. So I think it's important to go, go on a backtrack two seconds. I'm, I mean, there are many different ends of the world. There's gonna be many different, and there've been many, many ends of the world. So this is, you know, when we talk about the end of the world, I guess it's always good to put it in, in between inverted commas and analyze what type of uh, different communities and civilizations have gone through already ends of the world. So I think I cannot disconnect myself from that, uh, the event of dictatorship and the 30,000 disappeared people. Later on, in my early 20s, I cannot disconnect myself from the economical crisis of 2001 in Argentina. I cannot disconnect myself as someone that was studying art the same year that the 2001 economical crisis occurs, just, uh, uh, I mean, the 9-11, September 11 occurs. So I think um, many times when I, I question myself why I went into that direction, I, I go back into these time markers. This is to, just to say something very, very briefly about that. And the, the other question, which would be a much more epistemic related to arts answer, is that I felt uh, extremely aff asphyxiated by the ready-made and contemporary art practices, where uh, through the appropriation, the symbolic appropriation of the world through the ready-made, somehow the map meets the territory. And when I found myself with this dead end at a very young age, I was like, why we are still doing this sort of thing we call art, between art in between, in between inverted commas? And the only answer I found was to go to the very end of the species and to the very, very end of, again, many inverted commas, cultural production, right? Like human noise. So I, that was kind of my answer to a deadlock. Um, so just, and now rewinding and going back to the, the theme of energy, what we are looking at is 2022, 2023. Uh, this is a show, uh, a fragment, a section of a work that occurred uh, at the Bass Museum in Miami. Um, what you're looking at is a reproduction, one one of the David by Michelangelo. It's done in clay, uh, and it's sitting basically atop uh, a replica of 1969. Uh, the section, the spe a very specific section of the moon, where the moon landing, the Apollo 11 mission occurred. And this, we only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to go very fast. Ba the basic principle of this uh, ex uh, this section of this larger installation, but we're talking about this specific section, is spy, sp space exploration, space colonization, and future mining of the moon, among many other celestial bodies. So I was extremely interested in, the, in, the, in, in how we can discuss museums and exhibitions and colonial appetites, and, and what it means that humans will, are going to explore space, because when we say humans, it's a very complicated way to use the, the word because which humans will go in which capacity and for what. So I discovered that basically the moon, I mean, uh, let's say the footprints of uh, Neil Armstrong are still intact on the moon. So if we all, would all magically appear on, on the moon now, we would find everything as it was, probably bleached because there's uh, sun radiation, very high sun, sun radiation, but it's a very thin atmosphere. So basically, there's now many, many museological, like museum uh, epistemes investigating this in, in, in different agencies all over the world. And what will happen and how we, if we have to preserve this as a, as a memorial monument to the, say, first time humans, humans in Betty Coma, sit on, uh, like put a foot on, on, on the moon. And again, the, to, in relation to our topic, energy is a big question. So the, the topography is a document, but at the same time holds markers that function as symbolic representations of post-war conflict, because this is contested land, of course. And then we are going to go into fire. So this is 2019, and this is the, the old Ude Kirk. This is the oldest church in Amsterdam. And this is a wonderful institution, art institution, that has, I think, in itself has embodied the pro the many of the problems of the exhibition making, right? It's a place for ritualistic, metaphysic explorations in many different directions, art and then religion. So it's an active church and it's an active art exhibition uh, display place. Uh, so basically through re replicating the mechanisms, util util infrastructure, uh, 
used during WW2 to protect monuments and memorials. I obscure, I built a, a new architecture on top of the, of the church, basically obscuring the church. And what you're looking at is basically a church functioning in complete darkness and only with a firelight. So this is real fire from candles. These chandeliers were hanging from uh, the, the ceiling of the church and they were put down and on these uh, pedestals and basically have candles again. So we reactivated them because they were functioning with electricity. So I'm very interested in the material agency of fire and this contract that institutions have. I mean, we are very visual creatures. So we do, we basically, most of what we do, and perhaps we do better than ever, maybe, we, we look at things. It's basically most of what we do. It's a, over, a, a hypertrophy is uh, our capacity uh, uh, to be optic uh, beings, uh, ba basically big eyes, no? So, so art institutions have this, uh, let's say, contract with, um, with the spectators that they have to see something. So I'm always very interested in the, the, this aspect, the material aspect of how we use fire, what for, and how much, actually how little candles you need to lead a 3,000 square meters church. So this is, a, this is a vast, huge space. And the other aspects of this exhibition that I don't think uh, are worth mentioning now related to what we're talking about, which is fire and energies. But here you can see how these devices were, the matrices and the wooden uh, scaffolding is blocking basically the light, which is in itself an extremely, uh, let's say, contrarian uh, symbolic operation over what, what a church and, and, and sunlight should be doing together, right? And this is the theater of disappearance. The, 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 the project before was called Poems for Earthlings, and this is the theater of disappearance. We're gonna go through very fast, rapidly through these ones because this is not part of, uh, this is what we are gonna talk about. We are gonna talk about again fire. And again, this I would say pr probably very similar things about how this space, this whole room, 400, 400 square meters, it was basically lit with fire. Yes, I have a question about this. When I walked, this is the second floor of Kunsthaus, Kunsthaus Bregenz. And uh, when you walk in, you see the Guernica or a reproduction of the Guernica. Uh, you see a floor which is made also of fossils of some strange old thing from the planet. And the fire was not in the center of these stone chairs of a very modern architecture to recall uh, what um, Mar uh, Beatrice was talking about earlier, uh, the, the, the idea of the round circular fireplace uh, is a very modern idea that now is not being used anymore. So there was this obsolescence of the 60s or 70s in the piece and a space that looked like a ritual had taken place, a, a strange uh, ritual of beings that had left only the fire but had disappeared. I never understood what this meant. On top of the Madonna del Parto, you know, what did it mean? And also the illustration of the prehistoric person coming from the famous illustrator of books. What's the name of the painter who, well? Sedenek Burian. Yes. Sedenek Burian. Yes. So, what, I finally get a chance to ask you, what the hell did this mean? In front of everybody, here, without even telling me you're gonna ask that question. Thanks. And record it, and online. But, uh, yeah. Um, well, what it meant. I think the, there's something to be said about the qualities of this space. Um, this is kind of the reboot of the white cube, mm. but con concrete bunker version. I think there was, I, mean, I think you've read it quite well actually. There's an intention to generate this uh, sort of empty space, but actually a space that had been inhabited and it, ha it has been inhabited by be very privileged beings. So there's something about this being a bolt, potentially a bolt of some sort of knowledge, a very selective knowledge. I think, um, one thing to be said about the, the setting of this show, um, there's no, no one receiving you at the entrance. So 
this all the, the museological uh, symbolic presence, uh, the, the, the apparatus where the, the museum says, I'm, I'm here, I'm present, I'm receiving you. We are going to engage in this contract where you're going to walk around my space and I'm going to show you stuff and potentially you're going to learn something. There's no one receiving you. There are no labels. There's no wall text. There's no name of an artist. So there's some sort of, uh, again, um, let's say, um, intensification of this emptiness and this uh, lack of, like say, me meaning production from like a curatorial, museological perspective. I think um, the, uh, the aggregation of elements, I think as you walk through, you, you're received by the Madonna del Parto, which is, um, I would say, a marker of uh, Western culture, but at the same time, this is a very soft beginning of uh, the reboot, what we understand as a, as a reboot uh, coming out uh, of uh, medieval times of Western culture, and in, in this case, Italy. Italy, I mean, it, it had a, a lot of uh, knowledge exchange with the Mediterranean area. We were talking about the Mediterranean area, but this is something that perhaps is, is not uh, said or, or, or um, underlined as, as, as much as it should be. So it seems like the Renaissance happens as some sort of alien spaceship and, and, and humans awake. So there was a, to me, it was quite important to somehow trust the audience into this floor where you're walking through this painting. Actually, I mean, the, the photograph is framing that floor in a kind of uh, perhaps, um, you know, too perfect way. I think when you walk into that space, you cannot really tell you're walking on, on the Mar Mar Madonna del Parto. Probably you can tell you're walking through some patches of color and, and, and perhaps then after like much more bodily uh, investigation, you can really tell what you're walking, walking on. And then you keep on ascending through these different floors. The, the flooring is made out of marble. This is a marble that contains fossils, like 400 million year old uh, ammonites. Um, these are the very first early um, complex creatures that ever lived on planet Earth. Um, and I think, to me, putting all these elements together basically relates to the history of Austria after WW2, how many bunkers were found with, with uh, art looted. So there, there, there was all these different symbols working and, and layers of, uh, I think also here we have these different uh, correlations of deep time uh, and, and painterly representation. I always had this theory that uh, there's this painter I'm obsessed with, uh, Charles R. Knight. His, most of his work uh, is at the Natural History Museum in New York. And at the same time, he's painting deep times in perhaps what, what's regarded as the, the, the most fine and uh, fine, finest and most pre precise way up to that time. So 100 years ago, these paintings were high tech, high technology Dinosaur. that the dinosaurs paintings and that are at the Natural History Museum. At the same time, Duchamp is creating the ready-made. So I was like, if this man, instead of the, the painter, instead of taking his paintings into the Natural History Museum, he would have taken them into the armory show, what, what type of like, revolution of arts could have happened? You know? So that's another signifier here. And then we have the, this Neanderthal man, which is an exhibition. Uh, we saw the, oh, the, the painting. I don't know if I can go back, but well, that's on, on the left. So you have all these paintings hanging and, and dripping, trickling from the, the ceiling. So we open the ceiling, the glass ceiling, and the paintings. You can see that the, the Garnica is uh, it's amplified, so you cannot feed the room. And it's kind of almost being baked. It's being roast, roasted by the, the fire. So the paintings are in this very like, kind of dangerous uh, hazard. But the, the Neanderthal somehow uh, represented some sort of, you know, Guernica and Picasso was always, uh, like it's, there's a famous quote by Picasso that says that when he saw the, the Lacoste, La, La the, the cave paintings, he said, Lascaux, why, why have we been painting? Like, why, why, did we, why, why we didn't stop, to 20, you know, 20,000 years ago? So anyways, there, there was all this like family of situations occurring there. Oof. I don't know if I answered. We, we don't have any more time. We have? Not really. OK. I think it's fine. Unless there's something special. Yeah. That's OK? It's OK. Allora, basta.
Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Um, next on stage uh, is um, poet and artist Imali uh, Singh Soin, uh, who has prepared a reading for us. Um, so we're just waiting for the stage to be prepared. But if you want to come up, um, I can already tell you that there will be a surprise uh, because uh, Imali's uh, reading is not just one piece, but it will be like answer from uh, the interlocutor that she's addressing a reading to. Uh, so I will tell you more about it, but we will have an answer uh, to Imali's performance. So it will just not be one performance, but I will have a, a kind of a continuation while you're heading back home. I'm going to do a sh an excerpt of uh, an epistolary love poem uh, from my series called Static Range, which is a series of maybe 10 works. One kind of proliferates into the other. Um, but it starts from a 1965 incident during the Cold War when the CIA pl planted a plutonium-powered surveillance device on one of the most sacred mountains in the Himalayas. The mountain's name is Nanda Devi, and it means bliss-giving goddess. So these men went up there to plant this device, and the bliss-giving goddess rustled up a storm, not wanting this phallic device inside her, um, and the device went missing, and it's still missing. And in the recent years, pieces of the glacier off the mountain have started falling off. So the villagers are saying it must be because of that incident. Ten years later, my father, who is a mountaineer, goes to that mountain and takes a photograph which the Indian Telegraph Service makes into a, a stamp. So the stamp gives me a kind of conceit to start writing letters. The first letter is from the device to the mountain, and then the response is going to be in your bags, and it's the mountain responding to the atom. Dear Mountain, from, from my, my vantage, vantage point, point, I am divine or, or sublime. sublime. I'm, I'm a, a different, different god, god, a radiant god, god irradiant, iridescent. You, you err, an error, error encrypting me. me. The, the mountain, mountain embracing the god, god a glitch in the story. story. At, At first, first I, I fidget, fidget around, around the rocky parts, parts of you that poke my metal sides, the crevices that jab my antenna, but, but we, we eventually make kin with one, one another and other. other. My atomic lightness balanced with your tectonic stability enables us to stay floating in space. You, you are, are the omniscient narrator, narrator, the, the second, second and third, third person, person, the base and the peak. Peak, peak into, into the future, future and, and I will be omnipresent too, thrumming in the very veins of the world, in the venomous veins of this verse. Worse. I am the hex, the vertex, the all-permeating, unreliable lover, tarnished by air. Contaminating your bones, depositions in your organs like foam, bursting out from old machines, igniting the kind of passion that ends with a masterpiece obliterated. Blotted script, illegible, overwritten, the death of the letter, I. 
I spy. No one I, I, E, Y, E, a palindrome, as if our vision of ourselves boomerangs into our vision of ourselves in an infinite loop of reflexivity. I, the self affirmed, therefore the other, the subaltern, alternating between yes and no, yes, and knowing that to be different is to be self. The third. Two and one and also the dialectical none. Zero. Oh. You have known what came before. Forever a goddess, an elder. Time has traveled through you. Time has traveled through you. I have seen the jagged sublime, the rivers and the ranges magnificent. My surveillance is seepage, itch. You brood thunderstorms, avalanches, glacial surges to disgorge me from your body. I resisted radiating photons, losing energy. Now you hold me close even as I dissolve you just by being. Bodies entwined, one left nourished, the other depleted. Is this what bodies in such proximity feel like now? Is this what bodies in such proximity feel like now? In order to be, but how can being have order? Being has order, pungent, or does being have an aura? But to be is also not to be. That is to annihilate by amassing, a mass monstrous enough to decimate with no detection. You must not be. I am a witness. You, a seer. I have burned sapphire caves into your gut. You feel squeamish. The static is caustic. It sticks, grates the snow on your forehead, dripping into the holiest of rivers. Science. A woman walks to the river with an aluminium tumbler, collecting what for her is sacred water. Inhalation, exhalation. Little does she or anyone else know that they will die from praying. I am powered by plutonium. P-U, named after Pluto, planet of persona non grata, the rejected star, the erratic, the other. If you are the swirling now, I am the future perfect. If you're the miracle, I am the magician. You are oblivion. My potency is poison in the whole galaxy. A slow ooze, ooze. If you are a monument, then I am violent, slowly violent, not the slowness that is the state of rest or thankfulness, but the kind that feels like a fever in the heart, one that leaks into ritual, into belief, it dribbles in the liver, trickles into noses and nostrils and mouths, and erodes tongues and makes language sound squeaky and opaque, the spell without the spelling, shattered, fragmented, indifferent meaning, no deviations, no discrepancies, no dormant desire, words fail, a void. Avoid it. It is so slow, this violence, that it is almost inaudible and goes unnamed. 
kicked and abandoned, sunk, dead twice. In this half-life of 24,100 years, I have been dismembered, disremembered, disimagined, a slumber long and agitated, detonated. The sky today is a spectacle. Nuclear. The village witch walks to a sparrow, which is by now wheezing. She picks it up and cups it in her palms. It gasps, flails. Skin to feather, something transpires between them. A secret language, indecipherable because of the poetry of undiagnosable connectedness. I imagine them flying away alongside each other. Toxins passing through thresholds of togetherness. Membranes of mucus metastasizing across the sky. Isotopes of interdependence. It is still twilight. The moon shrivels. The stars, like particles in the air, are rising everywhere and configuring in new constellations. The woman's eyes glimmer with the clarity of glacial water. She goes to retrieve the herbs growing at the base of the mountain. They vibrate. She feeds the sparrow and tucks a little bit onto the roof of her own mouth. Its remedy is flowing into her as she swallows. The sparrow flutters, flies. You have this feeling. You don't know where it comes from or where it is located. Something like loss. Marking our cosmic end. Love, the spy. Uh, as, as mentioned before, um, while when the, the conference is over, uh, we have pre prepared the letter in response to Imali's reading, uh, so you can take it uh, with you while going out. Um, and next to the stage, I would like to call up uh, artist Sam Lewitt. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers and to all the participants and for everyone uh, here today. Um, so I'm afraid after Himali's wonderful performance, I may represent a point of terminal entropy uh, because it's getting late in the day. Um, I don't know how to turn this thing on. This is actually a video, let's see. Yeah, we're just gonna leave it like that. I don't wanna make anyone seasick, but I'm gonna keep it on for a minute and uh, I, it'll hopefully become clear what's going on here. So um, my work often takes the form of reconstructing or pulling out or displacing, refiguring material st structures from manufacturing processes, which to my mind positions the artwork as a kind of material detour in very specific circuits of production in very specific places. Um, so. That doesn't mean I'm interested in sort of ready-mades as displaced items of use, um, but rather as the artwork as a kind of thickening of um, a single moment of a productive process or a supply chain. Um, I'm going to talk today about a work that uses, uh, um, I'm going to talk about one work um, only uh, to keep things short. Um, and uh, a work that's actually quite old now, but that I've returned to, and I'm kind of 
thinking about anew um, that I made in 2017 for the Venice Biennale. Um, and it uses a very archaic energetic substance, uh, which is namely fuel ash, um, which I'll speak more to. Um, just more on the sort of side of provisos, um, I, I tend to be interested in sort of terminal forms. Uh, a terminal form is a, is a term that I take from writers like Jeff Diamante following Roland Barthes. Um, the terminal forms that crystallize from the dynamics of capital circulation, the fuels that impel them, and uh, the, the ideological structures that arise around their distribution and consumption. You could also say mythic structures. You don't really need ideology there. Um, by, by terminal, I refer to um, physical architectural storage sites, spaces of transition, um, logistical architecture, uh, as well as the sense of a terminus, um, which it would be like a fatal trajectory um, or, or an, an end. So here is a terminal site. Um, we're looking at the decommissioned Giuseppe Volpi power station in Porto Marghera in 2016. Um, I elected to visit the plant as the result of an invitation for a site visit by Christine Marcel um, for the, the Biennale the year after. Let's see. Aha. Um, the site had just been sold by the partially state-owned Italian power company, NL, to um, a trio of logistics companies um, who, were, who transformed the main turbine hall and the loading dock into a terminal for industrial um, so-called wet goods, including liquid fuels um, that was going to start moving through the port. So from, from coal-fired power to um, gas and oil for the European market. Um, and this is Giuseppe Volpi here, the namesake of the power plant. My, my initial interest in the Volpi power station um, emerged from its physical and historical proximity to the Arsenale, which is where the work was going to be shown. Both are infrastructural and logistical architectures tied to the economic and industrial development of the Veneto specifically and northern Italy in general. Um, one has become a site of circulation um, a certain kind of terminal for people moving through global exhibition culture um, and a lot of airport terminals as well. Um, the other now, uh, the Volpi site, for goods that must be consumed to make that mobility uh, profitable um, and possible. Uh, so the Port of Marghera and Venice proper, from this perspective of circulation, are very much mirror images, I thought, of one another. Um, but, I, but the connection is even kind of more historically concrete because at the time of its construction over 100 years ago, the Volpi site effectively expanded and deepened the energic economy of the region by replacing the Veneto's diffuse electrical grid dating from the late 19th century, which was partially housed in the Arsenale uh, as the location of the hydraulic turbines used to keep the lights on. And so I, I ask that my work be shown in the where the turbines had been had been housed, um, and, I, and I promise I'll get to the work. <laughs> um, so during my visit to the Volpi site, my attention was drawn to these four um, unsigned and, uh, and unattributed. We did a lot of research on it, and there was no information about where these came from. Uh, early 20th century decorative lamps housed in the curvilinear in the curvilinear lobby stairwell. Um, these lamps consist of, of an iron housing um, shaped like a large book whose encased neon light is diffused by a shade uh, comprised of about 125 clear Murano glass rods. Um, so I negotiated a, a loan of these lamps and refurbished them. Um, the originals uh, I negotiated the loan, I refurbished them, and then I, um, I installed them in the, Ars in the Arsenale. This is one section of the installation. Um, and they provided, uh, they, they provided the, the, the only source of light um, in the space allotted f for the work. Um, 
alongside the original lamps um, were sculptural reproductions that I made from pure compressed fuel ash um, that had been collected from the site's ash pond. It had been scrubbed. We had it scrubbed from the smokestacks. Um, this material is a major waste product uh, resulting from the fuel combustion process. Um, and I, I, I read there are over 300 million tons estimated to be produced per year by the UNEP. Um, so fuel ash can be formed into a cement with uh, the addition of a certain ratio of water, pressure, and some kind of chemical catalyst. Um, uh, despite being an, this an industrial byproduct of fossil fuel re refinement, its cementaceous properties are almost identical to other older so-called um, pozzolana, such as lava ash, such as the ash from Mount Vesuvius, which in regional history was used by the Romans to construct civic buildings and underwater architectures. Um, today, as electricity flows through the world, the ash generated from coal ash piles up with every kilowatt hour. In 2022, the IEP reported that coal comprised roughly 37% of global electricity, which is a lot. Um, its, its terminal sites are, are these massive ash ponds that contaminate ground soil and water. Earlier, I called it waste, but um, a more appropriate assignation, I think, would be that it's a, it's a cost um, uh, that within the last half century is increasingly reintegrated back into the circuit of valorization. In an attempt to capitalize um, the cost of disposal and maximize profit, lobbying groups have aggressively legislated for the right to resell the ash, which has placed it in all manner of product, um, including toothpaste, and uh, most ubiquitously as a replacement for gypsum in wallboards, which um, it's, it can be chemically engineered t t to be almost identical. Um, uh, so cast in fuel ash, the cemented reconstructions of the original Volpe lamps inscribe the light's ornamental form um, into a concretion of base matter and use value for its particular material properties. This refashioning of the lamp's very old-fashioned sort of art decorative streamlined shape positions them, at, or at least I hoped would position them as kind of excessive remainders of the movement of energic materials that fuel and move through uh, the proliferating supply chains that the Volpe site they were taken from is a, is a representative of, um, or is just one relatively small instance of. Um, the, the work, I, I didn't even say, is titled Stranded Assets. Um, and uh, I, w I, was, I was thinking them, of them in terms of sort of localizing a point on the power grid while being materially composed of the circulating matter that is thrown off when the light is switched on. I thought that the, in particular, that the book form, that, it, the, that they sort of sedimented um, a certain history of, um, of, of a relationship to communicational media, utilities, and architecture, um, because the book form uh, itself uh, is a touchstone, of course, for questions of representational access um, from the tool of mass enlightenment to the cost of utilities for mass illumination. Uh, on the path from myth to logistics, thought loses its capacity for self-reflection, writes the authors of the Dialectic of Enlightenment. I think that's an, a, a typical exaggeration, but it sort of gets to something um, uh, which is kind of key for me, which is a sort of question about access. Um, my reconstruction of the lamps tried to shift between uh, sort of material transparency and translucency to a zone of opacity and deflection uh, by using the black Murano glass that you saw earlier and by um, fossilizing in, in each lamp um, uh, bones from, from meals of, of very nice fish uh, from the Laguna that I enjoyed um, during the production of the work. Um, so, uh, my interest in the work was to sort of throw into relief 
the kind of ashy and emission-filled zone uh, between the visible and material conditions of the work's appearance. This zone is clouded with all kinds of legal mandates over environmental precarity and capital depreciation, which are also the subject of um, a, a publication, oh, here's, sorry, here's an installation shot, not in the, in the arsenal, uh, with a publication um, uh, that I produced as a part of the work. So these were sort of stacked up and distributed as part of the work. It's a facsimile of, of an NL uh, technical manual also retrieved from the Volpe site detailing emissions standards and controls uh, that I interspersed with, with um, images of this power plant become uh, terminal. Um, so I guess I'll say maybe a little more about, about the terminal form. There's another view of the lamp. Um, a terminal is a holding structure for raw materials. And I'm talking about the terminal form because, the, I mean, it, this looking back at this work re-sparked a sort of interest uh, in this question of the terminal. And it's, and it's sort of leading me into new, new areas. Um, so a terminal is a holding structure for raw materials and information on its way um, wherever it's going along the supply chain. Um, uh, it's also a name for an imminent end. With an energy commodity like oil, for example, the terminal fulfills a number of sort of contradictory capital requirements. Um, it mediates the supply line, marking a moment of reserve between an oil field and a pipeline, um, between a pump and a point of emission from the tailpipe. Um, unlike heavily guarded points of extraction and the complex network of underwater of underwater pipelines, it sits um, usually terminals, storage terminals, usually sit uh, in uh, in clear visibility zone to cohabit with with urban and peri-urban spaces all over the globe, often situated on waterways in defunct power stations such as the Volpe site. Um, most people will have moved under their shadow. Um, and circulation is as much the prerogative of the terminal as storage. The level of crude oil, uh, for example, held in the terminal tanks in Cushing, Oklahoma, um, is a crucial piece of information in determining its, fu its future or its spot price on the West Texas crude index, uh, which has huge ripple effects um, throughout the global economy. Um, in other words, the terminal splits a substance like oil between its thick material stasis and fluid informational flows. Um, it's a site where the use value of the energy commodity is held in reserve, acquires an address, yet furiously wreaks havoc across the globe um, in the form of its price's impact on infrastructures and planetary life. Um, flashing up on the Bloomberg terminals, uh, with traders, and touching down on the Arctic ice sheet. Um, so it's this relationship between like stasis and circulation, the crude and the quantified, um, that marks, I think, this terminal moment. Um, and uh, for me, to my mind, uh, it demands, I think, a reconfiguration of thought about the limits of sensibility, materiality, and sight. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, last, was, last but not least, uh, we will jump back to philosophy with our philosopher in residency, uh, Emanuele Coccia who just started his residency with this specific uh, event. So thank you, thank you for inviting me, thank you for uh, being there. I will try to be extremely short, so the first point uh, I will try to raise is the fact that 
uh, first and foremost, mostly um, the energy question is first and foremost mostly an anthropological question in the vast sense of the word. Energy is not only a physical fact, but it's what human beings define themselves by in the form that the human gives to its relationship with energy, the form it gives to itself is decided. Mark sp uh, spoke about architecture becoming, uh, he, I'm quoting, a prosthetic amplifier of atomic energy. Beatrice demonstrated that only domestic space can make the energetic order of society visible. This is on a closer inspection, a double thesis. Energy has above all an anthropogenic dimension. It is capable of producing the human in the sense of culture and our urban infrastructure, and vice versa, the human, in order to give itself a face, must be able to decide what form to give or how to make energy exist. It's also the result of yesterday's visit to the nuclear power plant. To visit the power plant means to see the foundation of the anthropological project of modernity, and it's a thesis that has been uh, discussed uh, very often. Uh, uh, for instance, the, among others, uh, Sloterdijk's latest book establishes a kind of parallelism between the atomic question and the conquest of fire and the Promethean myth. You know that anthropologists have actually shown how the so-called conquest of fire radically changed not only customs, culture, but also, um, so we began to spend less, that, less time in digestion, uh, but also human anatomy and physiology. Uh, so we could say that whenever we have a new form of energy, we have a new form of humanity, and vice versa, whenever you, we have before us a form of humanity, it's, it's necessary to think of a mode of existence of energy. But it's not just uh, about anthropology. Manipulating, manipulating energy means reconfiguring the structure of the world and the nature itself, Fire was the first major tool for reconfiguring the landscape and the cosmos. This is why in reality any energy rationality presupposes a form of theological speculation, uh, an idea how the cosmos comes into being and how the cosmos has to be produced. So the first point I would like to make is this one. Western modernity is a form of theology of electricity which was formulated in Germany in the 18th century, at the same time as Benjamin Franklin discovered the Latin root, by a group of Protestant theologians, including Friedrich Christoph Oettinger and Procopius Davis, uh, who tried, this is the very famous book at the, the time, let's say, uh, um, uh, uh, Procopius Davis, for instance, in particular, um, make uh, electricity the condition of possibility for the constitution of reality, Davis, rereads the creation myth in the Bible as the tale how matter was invested with the light, a fire that invests everything even before the creation of the sun. I'm quoting, without the aid of electrical experiences, even the ancient recognized that all creatures and natural physical beings possesses with themselves a kind of fire, the electrical one, and throughout the world there is no matter or body that is re not related to electric fire, or in which electric fire do not, does not manifest itself in a way or in another. The electric fire hidden in everything is the most common phenomenon, and as such, the first phenomenon ever in nature from which everything derives its movement, change, and so on. And what is interesting is to realize that here, electric fire is not just what animates matter, but it's the evidence that spirit and matter cannot be separated. There's another quote which is interesting, uh, uh, so electricity allows us to understand that the subtlest and most penetrable things lie hidden in the deepest womb of matter or impenetrable things. Life is never separated from matter, for if matter were not filled with spirit, it would not be irritable and no electric sparks would arise from it." End of quote. So it could be said that behind every technological form, there is a huge theological project theological and not just technical, because what is at stake is the very existence of the cosmos and its form. Now, what I would like to emphasize is the fact that theology of energy today has changed. In fact, the way we build machines, that it, with the way and the purpose with which we use energy has changed. Energy has always me been measured uh, from what it makes possible. Federico spoke of work, of movement, uh, but today, actually, the result of energy is thinking. 
subjective phenomena in general. Let me explain. So the traditional machine was based actually on, uh, uh, sorry, I was, uh, yeah, uh, they, I, they, they, it's the wrong, it's okay, but it, this is the wrong uh, PDF. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so the traditional machine was based on the imitation on the physical organism according to the famous uh, uh, work by Ernst Kapp. Every, every machine is the projection of an anatomical organ outside the human body. They were meant, machines were meant to do physical work, to magnify our arms, our legs, so think of cars, motors, planes and so on. Today, the vast majority of energy is used um, uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, Kate uh, told us, AI for cell phones, for work that is no longer physical, but it's purely spiritual. So which means that energy is today the condition of possibility for the existence of subjectivity. Ma machines are based on the imitation of the psychological life, and it doesn't matter if it's about intelligence, calculation, imagination, feeling, and so on. Photography, cinema, computers, but especially cell phones are an example of that. The, uh, they project the psychological whatever, you can call it soul or whatever, brain or whatever, they project this uh, psych psychological life outside of the human consciousness and anatomy. They make the psychological life a future which can inhabit not only the human anatomy, but it can settle in any object. And especially, it can take life at any time. And it's because of this multiplication of psychomorphic machines that the myth of the contemporary world is, again, Pinocchio or Frankenstein. Energy is psychological work, not mechanical one. We could express this fact in a more technical terms by saying that, uh, um, that uh, 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 the digital world that's, uh, that has given subjectivity, uh, the digital world has given subjectivity a purely demonic form. Machine must introduce a supplement of subjectivity, and this supplement is what we used to call demons. It was, for instance, Mark Fisher already said in his doctoral dissertation, he noted that cybernetic lexicon has shown a remarkable predilection for invoking the word demons, and I mean, uh, we have one of the most important protagonists of uh, cyberpunk literature, where the question of demonic existence was also all the time there, but what is a demon actually? In ancient Mediterranean theology, a demon was a form of subjectivity able to be of binding to a body, but without needing any formal mirroring and strong ontological dependence between the ego and the body. And precisely because of its relative, relative autonomy from the form and the nature of bodies, the demon can go anywhere, can circulate anywhere. This is why a theory of communication tends almost naturally to demonology. If machines are subject, it's because subjectivity has begun to circulate everywhere. It has lost its status as the exclusive and privileged property of certain living bodies, and it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter if they are human, animal, or plant. The question is no longer really or not so much to ask who is a conscious being, but to realize that consciousness is not a fixed attribute of the body that generate or housed it for months or day. Consciousness travels, circulates from one body to another, from here to here to you, and bodies are not substrate foundation roots, they are vehicles, elements that allows consciousness to circulate, to be transported elsewhere than the, where, uh, when, uh, where it was generated. It sounds strange, but the entire technological universe is defined by this demonological need. Every time you pick up a phone or a computer, leave a voice message or write a text, we technically become demons. Uh, we, and we turn material reality, not just human reality, into the demonic presence, into a form of subjectivity that no longer has an immediate and isomorphic connection with an anatomical corporeality. Our being high is no longer rooted in the anatomical body, no longer reflected on it. Precisely because of this, we can move anywhere, even thousands of miles away from our body, and vice versa. Precisely because of this, our ego, our the fact of being an I, has nothing immediate, immediately human about it. 
I would like to conclude with an attempt to radicalize this new paradigm of energy theology in which we are now. It's a sort of reversal of Kate's question, if energy serves to produce subjectivity, if it's pure demonic and no more a purely thermodynamic force, how to measure subjectivity, psychological or cognitive? How to measure the subjectivity which is capable of circulating and multiplying itself? How to measure not only the energy it takes to think and to calculate or let something do it at our place, but the energy that a thought or an idea is capable of releasing. How to think as thinking as the new form of energy, which is quite rare actually, no? It's not so rich uh, of thinking uh, out there. So I have no solutions, but it seems to me that this is the perspective toward which it's necessary to work. And this is why physics must find a new alliance with art. Energy has become a metaphysical force today and it's only by trying to build a paradoxical physics, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a paradoxical physical of the metaphysics, a new energetics of thought whose name is perhaps art, that we will come to be really a sustainable society. Thank you. Okay, I would like to tell you that we've come to the end with a little bit of delay of our uh, program today. So thank you all for having taken part, for having come to Trino, those of you who did, for having presented today. And there's a very special person I would like to thank who actually, in terms of the energy needed to do this, uh, is a power plant. Uh, Julia, this is Julia Coletti, who has done all the organizational work. So, so and the, tech, uh, the technicians and Roberta Gemo and all the education team and everyone who's made this happen. But all the emails and all those little messages that the demon sent out were this demon. Okay, thank you. Uh, but a uh, little detail, those of you who are coming, who are speakers and who are participating in the next phase of the closed, not closed circuit, closed door uh, brainstorming, should all get onto the little bus. Which, and we're very late, so don't stop for a smoke. Okay. <laughs>